there. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, first up, I'd like to welcome you to the City Council regular meeting for Thursday, July 13th. At this time, I will call the meeting to order and I will do the lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do I hear an adoption of the agenda? So nope. moved. Second. It's been moved and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Pass unanimously. Thank you, Council. On to the first thing. We have a possible support for the Veterans and Senior Service Levy. We have a special guest tonight, King County Council Member Rod Dembowski. Rod, welcome. Actually, I'm going to throw a little plug in. For the council member, if it wasn't for him, we would not have our new park across the street on the lake. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Johnson. And you need to raise up. <laughs> well, I have a I have a soft voice. Oh, for the button. All right. <laughs> the shorter I am, the taller I need this, right? <laughs> thank you very much, Mayor Johnson. Um my name is Rod Dombowski. I represent Lake Forest Park on the Metropolitan King County Council. It's great to see an active citizenry here tonight. <laughs> Good luck to you all. <laughs> I'm happy to not be on the Sound Transit board. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for noting our work together with the city, the council, the mayor's office to protect and to acquire actually the first public open space on Lake Washington for the city of Lake Forest Park with our conservation futures tax dollars. And I'm looking forward to working together with you to activate that and bring additional resources to support the Lake City. Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't matter what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 to bring that to life. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk about um, a measure that is on your August primary ballot. That's the King County's renewal proposal for the Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services Levy. This is a levy that was first proposed a long time ago by the predecessor in my seat, Bob Ferguson, when he occupied the seat for District 1 on the King County Council to support veterans and human services. In the intervening years, we've added seniors, and uh, I wanted to share a few slides with you ahead of your discussion tonight. Oh, I've got to do it, huh? Okay. Um, on what this proposal would do. Um, let's see if this will work. Look at that. Uh, by way of context, uh, King County, uh, over the last 20 years, our general fund has shrunk as our unincorporated areas have shrunk and cities have taken over. Whereas about a two and a quarter million people, there's about two and a quarter million people in the county today. Two million of those folks live in incorporated cities. So our general fund has shrunk uh, with our unincorporated population. Um, and we have shifted to a model, whether it be for parks, for behavioral health, uh, for children and youth, or for human services and veterans to a levy funded model where voters get the chance to say, what's in a package of services and do we wanna buy it? And uh, this is a renewal proposal, which we've come up on now every six years uh, is our cycle. It's on the August ballot. And the rate is 10 cents per one, it's a property tax. It's 10 cents per $1,000 of assessed value. Uh, so you have a million dollar house, that's $100 per year. Easy way to think of it. $800,000 house, $80 a year. That is the same rate that we uh, adopted six years ago. If by way of uh, explanation, because of the increase in assessed value in the, in the county, today you're paying at about 8.4 or 8.5 cents because the assessed value has gone up. So in fairness and in full disclosure, this is about a penny and a half more from what you're paying today, even though the rate's the same as what we adopted six years ago at 10 cents per thousand. Um, we have renewed this as the slide notes three times since 2005. In 2017, on the last time we added seniors. So we have delivered um, support to our senior center. I love our shoreline Lake Forest Park Senior Center. Our director's here tonight. It's just great to see you. She, give her a round of applause. She, yeah. What you did during the pandemic 
to give fee to feed and to care for and to give social interaction with and to check on senior citizens in our community um, cannot be overstated and could never be replaced. It's amazing what you did. So congrats, thank you very much. And the county was was pleased to be a small part of that to deliver in this levy support for our senior center. We also have the best veterans program in the country from a local government space. Uh, we have the Department of Veterans Affairs at the federal government, um, but King County, there is no better place if you are a veteran who needs some support in the housing space or in the behavioral health space to come for additional support. We have stepped up and deliver, and this levy is the support of that. And then the third bucket after seniors, not after, but on the same level after seniors um, and um, uh, uh, veterans is our vulnerable communities. Basically, it's the core of the county's human services function. Anything that you consider human services that the county does, this is how it's funded. Uh, so we're asking voters on the August ballot whether they want to renew this. It's over six years, $564 million. Uh, those are the three buckets. As I mentioned, it's 30% to each of those buckets, veterans, seniors, and human services, and then 10% an additional bucket for kind of special regional uh, initiatives. Uh, here's the record. It's pretty broad and pretty deep. 185,000 people have been touched with this levy in terms of services since 2018, 27,000 veterans, 100,000 seniors, um, 300 plus programs led by 150 or more community organizations. Housing is a big challenge, as you all know. Uh, I know you've worked on that as a council extensively in our region, affordable housing. Uh, a good piece of this levy goes into our housing money, including from veterans and our general human services function. We've helped to build 1,200 units of affordable housing, uh, almost 200 shelter beds. And a big success of this levy was prioritizing veterans homelessness and our VASH vouchers with the federal government to say, hey, we can leverage local dollars with the federal money and get veterans housed. There should not be anybody that served our country in uniform, in my view, who put their life on the line on the streets of this county. And this levy has gone a long way to do that. We had a massive reduction, a 40% reduction in veterans homelessness to, and we're on a path toward a functional zero. Uh, this levy really does that. Um, our senior centers in North King County have benefited, the North Shore Senior Center, the Kenmore branch of that, and the Shoreline Lake Forest Park Senior Center. Uh, this has been vital funding, and we are boosting the funding here to make sure that the Shoreline Lake Forest Park Senior Center is on par with everybody else uh, in King County. Wow. <laughs> All right, I think I messed up here. I went too fast. Uh, there's some additional statistics. Um, I don't, I don't want to take a lot of your time and keep folks waiting. The worst thing you want to do as a politician is to keep people from their microphone <laughs> <laughs> when they have something on their mind. Uh, but just know that this levy for a relatively modest investment overall does a lot of good work, um, and particularly uh, including here in North King County. It is our key funding uh, source in domestic violence and in civil legal aid and in food security in housing, this is the space that we go to at the county to fund those services. A um, few more stats, 80% of the veterans, seniors and human services levy housing stability program outcomes showed positive housing results. In other words, once we get you sheltered, things start turning around for the positive. Uh, two thirds of uh, a financial, from our financial stability program outcomes showed increases in financial security. And almost uh, more than 75% of our healthy living program outcomes showed improved health and well being outcomes. So, we do measure this. We have an annual report. We really believe in measuring outcomes. And when things aren't working, changing course, really holding the programs and our partners accountable. I'll skip ahead there. Um, that's a lot of graphs and charts, <laughs> which will be in your packet. And I don't know what that will take you to, but if you Google King County Veterans, Seniors and Human Services Levy, uh, we have a dashboard there. It, it measures our results. It shows what we're doing. 
And um, I just would respectfully request that this council um, seriously consider whether you feel that's appropriate to support uh, the renewal of this levy as part of our partnership uh, uh, in our region. We work at the county in partnership with the city. You have your role, we have ours, but one of our roles is as a regional partner with our city and our city, city partners. Um, and it is our core funding for support uh, for human services. Just on the North King County angle, we've helped build 130 units of affordable and supportive housing in the North End. Um, we moved our veterans center to Northgate, so it's easily accessible to North King County veterans. We have a lot of veterans up in North King County. Um, and our senior center investments have been uh, significant and will grow under this proposal. Um, so the department has done a lot of community outreach leading up to this renewal, listening to folks and helping build it. If the voters approve it, we will implement um, and adopt uh, an implementation plan. One of the things that I'm committed to working on in partnership with you all and our fellow leaders in the North End, including NUSA, the North Urban Human Services Alliance, is to make sure that North King County gets its fair share. You know, we don't have as much need as some communities in the county in terms of folks needing human services and housing. There's a lot more poverty just being candid with you in South King County. But we have folks that need help here. We have, we have significant needs in terms of affordable housing and folks needing human services and folks needing behavioral health care. And one of my jobs is to make sure that our partners at the county when we're making the decisions on grants understand that understands that King County uh, in the North End has its share of needs and that we get our share of the funding. Um, and that's something I'm committed to working on. So um, I uh, ask you to consider it carefully. And um, if you're so inclined, give a nod of support. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Council, do I have any questions for Rod? Yes, Councilmember Fairtani. Yes, Councilmember Dombowski, thank you very much for your presentation and for your work in securing this kind of funding and your uh, leading uh, the uh, renewal levy. Um, I'm also thankful for the uh, King County providing the uh, funding for the uh, mental health walk-in clinic centers. How do you see those two programs, this, this levy programs and that program uh, dovetailing with each other? Uh, Councilmember Furtani, thank you very much for the question. You're referring to uh, the recently passed in April um, crisis care center levy. Uh, that was a, a very special, significant investment that the county voters made. It passed by majority in Lake Forest Park, I want to note, um, to make a nine-year investment of $1.2 billion in crisis care centers around the county, five of them, including the very first one serving North King County, building on our radar navigator program uh, led by your law enforcement departments, including the Lake Forest Park Police Department. Um, and we're gonna build these crisis centers so folks that are experiencing a mental health challenge or a substance use disorder, uh, once they're engaged, have a place to go, to be stabilized. And then uh, a next set of beds because of complex Medicare rules to really be transitioned into, into longer term care and recovery. Uh, in addition to the crisis care centers, the levy will fund the uh, restoration of long-term care beds. We had about 500 in King County. Historically, we've lost a couple hundred beds just in the last few years. For a county of two and a quarter plus million people, we're down to about 300 long-term care beds for behavioral health challenges. It's insignificant. It's, it's not enough, so we're going to rebuild those. And then the third bucket of that levy is to rebuild the workforce to staff and facilitate all of these. This levy, the Veterans Seniors and Human Services levy, doesn't have the capacity, just by way of scale, this is about 550 million over six years. The crisis care levy is 1.2 billion over nine years. So the, we did not feel there was adequate room in this human services veterans and seniors levy to provide the response in the behavioral health space that we felt was needed to address folks who are really experiencing crisis on the streets, who are unsheltered, unhoused, and really can't take care of themselves. So they will work together, but the added resources of the new levy we felt were, and the voters felt uh, were necessary to 
deliver the kind of response that was needed to address that particular crisis. All right. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Well, Rod, you got it off easy today. I got it for real easy. Yeah. Good luck to you all. Well, no, you remember you sure. signed up to stay. So come on up. <laughs> you are a council. You are a council member, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Rod, very much. And thanks again for everything you do for us, uh, really. Mayor and council, um, it's a privilege to represent Lake Forest Park on the King County Council and to partner with you. You have a first class council. And if I might, I don't know if I'll have another chance since it's mid July, but a key partner in our work at the county has been your colleague, council member Cassover, mm -hmm. for a number of years. And, um, in addition to a super talented public official with big policy chops, who's engaged in a lot of work you don't see. How do we handle our solid waste? How do we improve recycling? The county has a big role in that. How do we advance our climate action policies? How do we su ensure support for arts and culture? Um, Councilmember Kessover is not just, and I don't mean that in an insulting way, a Lake Forest Park City Council member, she is a regional leader, which I've had the privilege to see in my time in this job. Uh, and not only a, a leader, but an incredible, incredibly wonderful human being, just a wonderful person. And I wanna just take this moment since I've been given this mic <laughs> <laughs> tonight to express my personal admiration and appreciation for her and the service she has given to this community and the fact that she has stepped up and led on issues countywide that will make a difference to many people, more than 2 million people for years and years and years to come. And it's just been an honor to work with her and I'm sorry she's leaving, but this community, this city has been blessed to have you sitting in that seat. And I wanna thank you very much, Philippa. Thank you, Rod. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, before we bring up our guests tonight, what we're going to do, the way we're going to do this, we'll bring up Sound Transit CEO Julie Tim. She has a presentation, and then the council will be asking her some questions. And then at that time, it depends how long that is from now, we might take a small bathroom break. I'm gonna ask really nicely when she's doing her thing, when the council's asking them, and along with when you guys do your speak, please respectful of all the time. There's a lot of you here. I will try to speak loudly, but um, we are Lake Forest Park. We're good people. So let's move through this and do it quite well. So at this time, um, I'm gonna welcome the CEO of Sound Transit, Julie Tim. Thank you, Julie. Okay, let's bring to a mic check here. Uh, Ken, is that easy in the back to hear me? I can't look back. Good. Awesome. Thank you so much. I do have a presentation that's been prepared, but first I want to say thank you so much for allowing me to come and talk to you directly about what we're doing at Sound Transit. I understand that this has been a, a very challenging conversation over the past several months, and I am here to listen. Um, I have a long presentation. I'm going to rush through a lot of it so that we can get to exactly the issues that you want to talk about, that you want me to hear. And also, I don't want to take too much of your time talking about the bigger picture of everything we're doing in the region, uh, because I know that it's going to be a long night. You have a lot of citizens who want to express their feelings to you, and I, um, I want to make sure that I respect that time. So I'm not sure if the, I have a presentation. I'm not sure if it's going to come up on the screen. There we go. Awesome. So thank you again, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council for having me here tonight. I do truly appreciate the opportunity to talk about these issues. Sound Transit is an, an investment in this region. It's an investment in this community. And while I understand that many people here voted for it, many people here want to see those regional connectivities, that regional access come to life, it does come with some pain and we need to figure out how to have a conversation about what we can do to make it better. 
And I, I want to start by acknowledging that. I also want to start by acknowledging that there was an original project that was coming through the community pre-COVID that was going to have significant impacts to several homes. And in that community conversation, the community asked, can we do something to save the homes? Sound Transit did listen, and they respected that and made an alteration. The problem then becomes COVID. We can't blame everything on COVID. I do know the team tried very hard to reach out and with moderate success to low success. And that wasn't just here, that was transit agencies across the country. I've been here for nine months. I was a CEO in Richmond before that, trying to get community engagement through COVID and it was truly a challenge. We're past COVID and now's the time for us to get back together and have these conversations and understand what is it that we can do to protect the character of Lake Forest Park, as well as put this investment in for this community and the region. So that's my opening comment. And I'm gonna go through these next slides pretty fast because they, they, I think many of you might know them. Some of you who have lived here for decades and generations may know them better than I have. I've been here for nine months. And if there are questions that you ask that I can't answer, I do have staff here to help. So see if I can figure out how to work this. Oh, there we go. I'm gonna go through these very quickly. Sound Transit as a whole, we are working towards building a regional network. It has been coming for decades. Even before 1996, there were votes on it. We know that that system currently is running with 26 miles, 25 miles of light rail and two uh, sounder lines, north and south, and that we're looking at ST Express. And that when the voter approved referendum came through for ST3, there was a, an upwelling, upswelling of desire to see more to connect this community. This community did not want to be bypassed and the region listened. And we see that now that the plan for sound transit is to provide high capacity transit connectivity for 116 miles of light rail for 91 miles of sounder train and 45 miles of bus rapid transit. And that's a significant investment that this community is helping to pay for. Now that system expansion is going to, is only as valuable to this community, it's only as valuable to this region as it is effective in actually serving the mission of connecting people and connecting people to jobs and resources, also enhancing the communities we serve, not nearly, not nearly taking away what you value. We do know that and we do hear it. The pain point for Sound Transit board members, for staff and for me, is that there is no perfect transportation solution anymore. Anything that we build is going to come not just with a financial price, but with a conversation about the trade-offs and our values of how do we put this investment into place and what does that cost our communities? Now, when we talk about the background of what this looked like, again, I don't wanna beat you up, beat up on history here. There was a lot of people who supported it and what you're getting is not necessarily what you, what you thought you were getting when you voted for it. We recognize that. And yet it's still a valuable investment. And we've heard that from you and we've heard it from your citizens. When the Stride Bus BRT opens, and right now we're going through what's called a baselining. I just spent uh, three and a half hours with my board, with a system expansion committee. A significant part of that meeting was talking about this very project throughout the region, how it connects and the challenges with putting a significant investment like this in, it really is a challenge, but there's some good news with it. It is advancing. The 405 section had some major contracts that were just let. We are moving forward with some design enhancement in this community that we will talk about. It's moving forward with 100% battery electric buses. That wasn't the case when this was voted on and it wasn't the case when we first came out here pre-COVID. They are now going to be fully battery electric. That's a significant improvement from what it was going to be. The project timeline and phases, again, this is going backwards, looking at where it started uh, with the changes, especially in 2021. 2021 really was when we were still facing some of the lack of communication in COVID. There was an environmental assessment that was done for this under the State Environmental Policy Act. I did read that entire thing last night. It is quite lengthy and is quite complete. Uh, it is, it, I was looking for some place that I can come in and say, hey, um, we, we got something wrong here and we're gonna fix it. And honestly, it's a very good document. 
I have done NEPA for 25 years and it's solid. Now, when we're talking about the SR 52, 522 Northeast 145 Street BRT, we're looking at nine miles, 14 stations. And I understand that this community has the most significant substantial impacts that are your feeling. You're the ones that have the majority of the residential impacts. You have the majority of the tree impacts. Unfortunately, I've been looking at this. I, when I first got here, I walked through, I drove through, I did it again earlier this week, last week. I've done it again with the community just this morning. Looking for, is there anything that the team may have missed? And we have smart people to get through here in another way on another corridor. And there is none. How do we justify the impacts that this community, community will feel? You've heard a lot of information being presented. A lot of it is true and some of it is misunderstood. I'm not gonna be able to answer all the questions tonight. I'm not gonna be able to clarify all of it tonight. My commitment is going to be as we go through this presentation to give you a little bit of that information and I have personally committed to my team and I will commit to you and this community that we will set up another community meeting and I will be here to listen and to talk through what we are doing to improve the project. One of the things that people have said, they've said it from the board, I know they've said it to you, I know they've said it to each other, is two minutes worth the impact. And it's not two minutes. It's not two minutes. What you have to think about when you look at projects of this size is you're looking at, Yes, it's two minutes for one person, one bus, times the number of buses, times the number of hours, times the number of days, times the number of years across the entire system. And when you create a bottleneck in the middle of a high capacity transit system, you jeopardize that value for the entire region. It is a hard truth, but it is a truth. Now, going specifically, going to this community, and the circle is the area where you live. Okay. There has been community engagement. It has not been as sufficient as I hear you want, and we are committed to keeping coming out. I am here today for this reason. We will come out again later this month for this reason. And as we start finishing the design, we will come back out again in the September, October, November timeframe, and we will keep coming out and keep having conversations and we will keep looking for solutions. You will not get everything you want. We will not get everything we need. This is also a hard truth. Okay. What we've heard, we've heard the trees. The trees are the character of this community. We've heard, can we do something that's different with the stations? Can we do something different with the bat lanes? Can we look at queue jumps? Can we look at narrower sections? I do have answers to those. Can we look at saving the context of historic neighborhoods, creating more character? If we can't change what we're doing, can we change how it looks and how it feels? The retaining wall is one of those areas. Can we do it in a different way that helps advance the green space faster, that looks better, that is maintained differently? These are all things that we have heard and they're all things that we want to work with the community to address. I have also heard that's not on here, the conversation of can we eliminate the sidewalks? I can tell you that my team got beat up for about an hour today from the board about why we don't have sidewalks on both sides of the roads. There is a very strong debate in the transportation community about where and how we need sidewalks. And I understand that there are other alternatives to walking and I've walked the quarter and as it is today, it is a challenging and dangerous quarter to walk. As it is proposed, the sidewalk that is proposed on a single side of the road will be protected from the traffic by that bat lane. It will be safe and it will be a lot more comfortable than what you envision today and being there today. And it will create a connectivity that is accessible for our elderly, for our children who walk that corridor. I saw some today, 15 year old children walking along the corridor next to that road. Having that sidewalk there will create an improvement for our children, our elderly, and those in need of additional access such as people in wheelchairs. And still, we can talk about how to do it better. Some of the community-driven shifts that we're talking about, again, 
looking at a better wall design that fits the character of the neighborhood. Those are challenging conversations because they do mean a deviation from what WashDOT would normally do. And what does that mean? We're gonna keep having that conversation. The tree canopy retention, the team has already looked at what we can do and they've removed 20% of the impacts already. And we're not done. We're gonna keep looking. That is an improvement. It's not perfect, but it is an improvement. That west shift does save homes. I understand it is painful that it will take more trees and it will take pieces of property. And I understand that it puts that network closer to people's homes and it saves homes. So again, I wanna summarize by saying finally, I'm here to listen, hopefully answer some questions and then come back. I'm not gonna stay during the public comment. And I, I wanna say the reason for that is because is because I have staff who live in this community and they need the safe space to be able to speak their piece without their CEO listening to them and feeling that psychological safety. I will listen while I'm here. I will come back to the community and you will have a chance to talk to me directly. I've committed to that and I will do it as much as necessary until this project's built. That is my commitment to you. <clears throat> And with that, I am ready for questions. Council. Council Member Casover. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And um, CEO Tin, thank you so much for being here and for accepting my invitation when we, when we met online through the Seashore Transportation Commission, which I chair. Um, <laughs> so the community does have questions. Yes. And they have questions that they have directed to us as a council and we can't answer them, but you can. So I thank you for some of the answers you've given today, but I'd like to ask for a little bit more detail on a couple of things. Of course. Um, one of the questions that has been asked is um, about the wall and its design. And you mentioned just a minute ago that conversations are ongoing. Uh, we hope that there's actually more than conversations just at this point. We hope there's actual decision-making going on. So I wondered if you could elaborate just a bit on that. Unfortunately, I cannot. My team can tell you where they are with that. We are currently in the 60 to 90% design process. That's why it's an ongoing conversation because the design is still in process. I understand that there is a wash dot standard and there is a desire from the city to see something different. And there is a need to maintain that wall to prevent graffiti, to be able to maintain it. And part of that will require a commitment from city uh, Lake Forest Park. And part of it, if you want those, what does that look like? What does that mean? And I do not believe that we have come to a point where that final design is in a place that the city has said, yes, this is what we will take on. If I could just follow up with that. Um the information that we have that we have in fact passed an ordinance uh an interim ordinance and we'll go on to work on it a little bit more uh determining the design of the wall and committing to our part of the maintenance um and the graffiti removal etc so you know i think maybe we're a little further along than maybe <laughs> you know that is good news <laughs> okay i'm glad to uh, hear that and then the next uh issue that I'd like to um, really raise with you is the need for the bat lane and whether or not there is any possibility that queue jumps are even being considered or whether that's completely off the table. And I think the community would really benefit from a very clear answer on this if you can give us one. I cannot give you the, the clearest answer I can give you. I wish I could, and I will, I will elaborate. There is, for us to go and change from the bat lanes to a queue jump design, will set the project back by a, a, a significant number of months or longer because we are so far into the design. That's not a great answer. I have more. Uh, the board is under a lot of pressure, as we all are, as all councils are, to move projects forward because costs are only going up. So that is a significant 
pressure on my board. They're the ones that will make the decision, not me. Uh, the, also, I think that's relevant to say is that the board is the decision maker on all these projects. I think people know that, but sometimes they don't. So the, to be clear, the board will make the final decision on how this project moves forward, and they have done so. For them to go back and reverse that decision is unlikely. Now, I went with the team myself to look and walk that alignment and see where there might be opportunities for me to go back to the board and say, I think it's valuable to reconsider. And I looked at it from the engineering perspective. I looked at where the, the stations are and the operations of how buses are gonna come into and out of and through those lanes. I watched traffic come through that area. I do not believe that the bat lanes are, um, let me rephrase that. I do not believe that Q jumps will solve the problems the way we think, the, the way community thinks, the way it's been presented in community meetings. With that said, that's one of the items that I would like to come back and talk with the community about in detail later this month to lay out the maps and to really walk through the operations of the buses, how Q lanes work, how the kind of, uh, of space that a bus needs when it's at a station to merge back into traffic, to get through lanes. And when you have that kind of emerge necessary to get in and out so that you don't create that bottleneck, that is what we're trying to prevent by the, the queue lanes. When you have that, you almost you, you almost have a bat lane. Uh, there, there's not a lot of savings in there. There's, there would be some, but it becomes jagged. When I worked in Richmond, Virginia, we had BRT there and they made some compromises on how those lanes worked. And it significantly degraded the system and it made it very hazardous for the buses and it, the, the hazard is there now for the current buses to pull out of traffic and then to pull back in and how that works and how they get speed and how they go through, go through there is still a very significant amount of infrastructure to make the system work as intended. So it's not a clear answer, but I, that's the best that I can give is that it is very unlikely that the project would change at this time for the bat lanes. Thank you. I, I'll defer now to my other council members. Uh, Deputy Mayor French, and then Council Member Bodie, then Council Member Riddle. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, I appreciate uh, under the circumstances you're coming into a, uh, a big crowd here. Um, a couple of things. I One of the things that really troubles us as a community is that we're having this conversation now and we're at 90%. This body sent a letter to the board in December of last year, and we have still not receive a response regarding a pause about the considerations for this community. We had asked at the time to consider trees. Eventually, some of the staff, uh, after some prompting by a number of us on the council about um, construction easements, went back and revisited the tree consideration. And I applaud you for finding ways to reduce the number. It's still not low enough. At 90%, I am deeply concerned that now we're talking about community engagement, and I don't know where this came from. I don't know how it happened, but I thank you for being here. I just want to know how we're going to tell this community, after all the work and all the emotional energy that they've invested in, in these discussions, that it's going to be a generation-altering altering project, that we are at this place where there might be some small considerations. What are your thoughts about that? Mm. It's sort of like it, the horse has left the barn and we're watching it go away. And here we are. I do understand that. I do very much understand that. It is hard to reverse decisions that have been made over the course of many years. And it is hard to have conversations now in person when for the past three years, those conversations has been virtually and people feel missed and they feel that they haven't been heard. The project has been decided on by the Sound Transit Board. I know people say this, it doesn't help when, and so I'm gonna repeat something that is just painful to say. It's moving forward as part of the voter approved referendum. And we are still committed to working with the community to try and minimize where we can. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, there are some things that aren't going to change in the project at this time, but there are things that we can continue to support the conversation. How can we support the saving of more trees? How can we support the character of the transit shelters? How can we support 
the, the wall and vegetation on the wall? How can we support the historic uh, framing of the Sheraton Beach community and the signs there? Not just that, but also put more context into it. There are things that we can do at this time, but significant changes to this project are unlikely. Thank you. Just one more follow up question, just on point. Um, a couple of us, a number of us, and many members of the community participated in an expansion committee um, meeting in, I believe it was February. And unfortunately, due to the number of people that were making public comment, those of us who were online were unable to even comment mm -hmm. on the decision that was made prior to our ability to comment. Comment was tabled, then we made comment after the fact. After the fact, This is the kind of example about communication that makes this community really unhappy. Yeah, yeah. And I... <laughs> Please be respectful, folks. I, I, I understand this, but I really, I cannot stress enough that the communication from Sound Transit with this community has, it has not been lacking, it has been abysmal. And I appreciate your coming here. I think you're a very great person, quite honestly, because this, this crowd is, is, is frustrated as, as many of us are. And I applaud you for re-engaging. So we really hope as a community, I fervently hope, that this engagement is real and it's going to be something that in the last 10% of whatever this looks like, it can make a meaningful difference in the lives of this community. Thank you for that comment. Thank you for the opportunity to be here again. I know that the trust is broken. I do know that. I hear it, I've seen it, I've read the letters and I was in those meetings when that community comment was split and was pushed to after, I do see that. And the trust won't be rebuilt overnight. You'll have to wait and see if I actually do what I say I'm going to do. And that's when we'll get the trust back. Thank you. Councilmember Bodie, then Councilmember Riddle. Yes, thank you very much, CEO Tim. And I appreciate your recap. I'd like to provide a recap because um, like the deputy mayor, I've participated in all the public meetings over the last two to three years plus a number of sound transit board and system and one system expansion committee meeting. And it's been hard to get the full picture out. Certainly sometimes you only have two minutes and half the, half the board members have left the room already, right? So it's been the experience of our whole community, but also ours as council members personally. So uh, I would just would reiterate that several months ago now, our council unanimously requested that Sound Transit pause the BRT project design through our city, but it was then only at the draft 60% level. So you can imagine our frustration to suddenly hear about that we're, oh, we're at the 90% level. Um, and we wanted to work on design refinements of the sort that we're talking about today. Um, our objective was to get those meaningful changes that we're talking about before it was too late. Um, but there's been no pause and we have yet to receive any kind of uh, formal reply. Instead, I would say that the community engagement to date has been a um, uh, tell with a check the box exercise. And again, I've been to all the community engagement meetings, including during COVID. Um, in fact, one of the meetings I went to uh, during COVID, um, the people didn't know where Lake Forest Park was, the people who are stashing the tables, because uh, it was a consultant driven uh, activity. Um, so, and also a lot of the changes we're talking about today have been discussed not over just the last few months, but over a period of two to three years. And even two years ago, we were hearing from staff, oh, it's too late, you voted for this um, and, and so forth. So I, I would just wanna say as a former federal executive who was in charge of assessment and mitigation for very large regional construction projects, I really couldn't understand the unresponsiveness. I found it very frustrating all along. So again, I wanna thank you 
um, just like my colleagues did. I really appreciate your being here to listen. I appreciate your um, considering the trade-offs and Lake Forest Park values and the needs of the community balanced with the transit goals. I think that's very important. Um, and it's very much appreciated that you're committing to follow up as well. Um, I do wanna say that though we voted for ST3 as a community, this is not the project we voted for or the impacts we thought we were gonna get. In fact, there have been a lot of changes. So, so that just isn't a very good response. Conceptually, the BRT writ large is something we voted for, but not all these details and, and impacts. And I, I would just say, well, you talked about the fact that we have to look at the two minutes or in the morning, the 42 seconds of improvement through Lake Forest Park, but we have to look at that in the larger context. The fact is, it's really big impacts for in our city for small improvements in transit time through our city. So yes, it's part of a larger whole, but I don't think that necessarily carries a huge amount of weight for our community. There's a cost benefit here. So, so making some meaningful design changes uh, in the project, even at this stage, even if it takes a few months, is a matter of equity. Because as you yourself have acknowledged, we're the smallest, most heavily impacted, and costliest part of the BRT segment. Um, we have the largest number of affected residences, over 75 homes, and at least 65% of your property acquisition and permitting budget, more than half of the private property acquisitions, uh, the, the, a bustling construction that will bring roads and road impacts right up to people's front doors and back doors and driveways. So it's really, even though the full taking of some properties has been avoided. The impacts are on people's quality of life. In some cases, people who have generational homes um, is really going to be affected. We've already addressed the trees and shrubs, but I would note also that there's greenhouse and noise impacts associated with the removal of the trees and shrubs. The, please don't. Um, the largest retaining wall uh, of the whole project, it's you know, when you when you look at the visuals, it's huge and it goes 4,000 feet and it completely changes the green gateway uh, and the center of our community uh, here through uh, going, going in this direction. There's huge hillside and steep slope excavations with as much as 90,000 tons of dirt and debris to be hauled. There's removal of 28 trees on a steep, steep slope, which you probably saw today, designated a landside hazard area that has already failed and that has a fish bearing stream underneath it. Um, and we ha also have the largest stormwater runoff impacts, increasing impervious surfaces by 1.3 acres and affecting again, three fish, fish streams and the largest residential noise impacts, which goes along with the roads coming closer. And the current design has not been studied um, for the noise impacts with the tree removal and the current um, configuration. But even so, some properties were considered unacceptable for residential land use without, without mitigation in the existing SEPA noise study. So again, for what cost benefit? Um, we talked about the, the improvement of uh, 42 seconds in the morning and two minutes in the afternoon. Um, but, but by way of example, the Q jump improvements on 145th, which cover about 1.3 miles, um, so roughly comparable, are going to provide 10 minutes of peak hour improvements. So again, when you look at the cost benefit in the holistic sense, I think it is important to consider the Q-Jump alternative for Lake Forest Park. And I appreciate the fact that you're willing to, uh, to do that and take a look at it. Again, no, no one is saying it won't involve some property acquisitions and other impacts, but, it, but if we can lessen them and affect fewer residences and, and, and less, and save you construction costs, why isn't that better? Um, so uh, I think that what you've heard from our community is we're looking for 
effective, efficient, smart design changes. None of this is um, you know, superfluous stuff that we're asking about. Um, we want things to be less costly, less massive, and a little more environmentally sensitive. That's all. It, it isn't a lot to ask. There is a win-win here in going back and looking at the design, I think. And, and, and as a responsive government partner, I think it would be good to pause as we had requested, as our council had requested, and consider design refinements. So you've mentioned some of them. I just want to list, go through and list them quickly. Um, replacing the full bus lane with jump the queue lanes, uh, using smaller bus stop designs at 153rd and 165th, um, providing a retaining wall that has smaller dimensions if possible, sound attenuation and incorporating tree and vine plantings, uh, you know, greenery to preserve that city gateway, um, developing tree planting mitigation that is in place and in kind to the fullest extent possible and retains that green gateway that we have in Lake Forest Park. And last, and this is, a, this is I admit, a recent concern that has been raised, um, installing low profile security lighting along the sidewalk so we don't increase a public safety uh, issue there uh, unnecessarily by, by not thinking about it. So I appreciate your considering these changes before proceeding further. I appreciate a kind of pause, if you will, um, for, and, uh, for the listening. Um, and I think that um, as CEO, this is an opportunity to show regional leadership, um, responsive and good government, um, achieve substantial cost savings, or at least some cost savings, uh, if, depending on the cost of the, of the Q jumps. And also, very importantly, conserve important environmental uh, lands and waters, um, which is an, a big value in our community. So thank you very much again. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me go through this um, overview. And uh, I really appreciate your ongoing um, consideration and concern for Lake Forest Park. Thank Absolutely. you. And, and thank you for taking so much time to really review and understand the project. It, it takes a lot of dedication to take that much time to understand the project. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Riddle. Thank you. And thank you, CEO Tim, for, for being here. I know it does put you in a bit of an awkward position. Um, but I wonder why the board put you in this position, to be honest. They've done some things, as my colleagues have mentioned. They have not, frankly, not listened to us. Um, voting before hearing us didn't even put on the air of listening to us. Uh, it really felt, uh, it, it felt terrible, to be honest, um, to know that they really, they really didn't care to hear from us, as, as is evidenced by their vote. Um, and this isn't the first time that we've been put to task by the Sound Transit Board for, for, for trying to advocate for our community. And uh, the last time we, were, we got into a challenging situation, they delayed our parking garage 20 years. At some point, it starts to feel like retaliation. And it really hurts because we are a great community. This project is a great um, benefit to our community and to those up and down our corridor. The North End is tightly knit. We want to work as a good community partners with all of our neighboring cities, but to what expense? So I, I, I council member Bodie mentioned the lighting. I spoke with the chief briefly. There have been fatalities, there have been accidents, there have been issues about safety. And that lighting would give him another tool to bring safety to that corridor that doesn't exist right now and he wishes he had. So think about that and just think about talking about your sidewalks and maintaining that safety for those pedestrians, that lighting, that pedestrian level lighting, not, not highway lighting, pedestrian level lighting for that safety is really critical for our, our, our officers to be able to patrol and really make sure that place is staying safe. And I think that's what we both want. Thank you. Earlier, before I came here, I did meet with some of the community members and they did bring that up. I think I talked with the team right before coming in here and we were very intrigued by it and looking forward to exploring that. Thank Again, thank you. I will um, acknowledge that the, the letter that you sent did go to the board. Uh, they did read it. We did talk about it. 
I apologize that they did not get back to you. I will take responsibility for some of that because um, I know that everyone, you all, and they and me are very busy and that is not an excuse. And I will, I was, I had the letter on my desk actually to create a response and send back to you just last week. And I felt that doing it at this time would actually almost be an insult. I wanted to talk to you face to face so that I could respond back afterwards. Yeah, appreciate the response. Okay eventually, <laughs> but I do appreciate it. I understand. Um, you've heard about the noise, um, you know, the, the, the studies and, the, and so forth. They may not say that there is an engineering reason to deal with the noise, but experientially, these reflected noises reflect your high frequency sounds. And, and that sounds different to a human who's sitting on the other side in their living room. And it has that white noise buzz that you get from highways. And that's that's the sound that's going to increase. You know, it may not be the whole spectrum, but that's where our, our our friends along that highway are going to be impacted. And so I think having some more focused understanding of the real impact, looking at other communities where they've added perhaps um, sound insulation, and and the response from the communities across from that, oh, it's so much better. I can't believe I got that sound went away but the engineering didn't require it when the sound walls built. And so I think that there's a disconnect between where the engineering is and where the experience of our human beings on the other side really feel. So I would love to have some more exploration of that and to really push that. I know that's kind of a wash dot thing, but I think we can come together and really say, okay, what is the right answer here? Not just tick the boxes that I did this, but what is the real right answer? We have a giant curve that's gonna really do some really crazy reflections at those few houses that are kind of in the curve. I just want us to spend more time. Um, speed. Okay, so this is something that we were looking at speed in our community. And, and the one thing that came sort of that I learned is you can't design a road for less than its speed limit. So you lower the speed limit, even though the road might be big, so that when you come and work on the road later, you can then design it to the appropriate speed limit. You can't you know, um, you can't do that after the fact with the kind of work that you guys are doing. So if you design your design to a 40 mile an hour road, our neighbors 35, 35, 35, 104 is 35, we're 40. And we don't have the same commercial access that kind of is a high traffic commercial access, but we have homes that back their cars into that highway. Why is it 40 still? for this tiny stretch and Washdot is looking into it. They, I don't think, I don't know where they are with it. I can't read the crystal ball, but if they don't lower that speed limit before you do finalize your design, we're gonna have a giant road that maybe eventually they'll consider it 35, but people aren't gonna go 35 because the road doesn't feel it. And you know, people drive how they feel they can drive. Smaller lanes, less excavation, smaller um, retaining wall, calmer city that five mile an hour difference for those two miles is not a huge difference especially with your bat lanes mm -hmm. right because <laughs> you're not going to be stuck in the traffic i really want us to focus on what is the right way of doing this right can we look at reducing those speeds before you finish your design can we shrink your design save some money the most expensive thing is to move dirt out of here don't move the dirt don't take the land. Don't build this tall of a wall. You're, it's all compounding savings and it benefits us. It benefits you. And Wash that really don't care because it's just, you know, they put the speed limit on it and they're happy. So let's find a way to continue that conversation because I think there's something there we can really, really do that will benefit this community. I would very much appreciate a conversation on speed limits. I think that that can be a very triggering conversation for many people. There's people on both sides of that spectrum. I tend to be a proponent of lower speed limits. I find they're safer roads, they're safer for all of our citizens, but not everyone feels that way. I look forward to going back and talking to my team about what they have looked at and coming back later this month and having some real conversations about that one. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and if I maybe um, entertain just one other thing, green walls. I know it's not the WashDOT standard, the closest we can get to returning greenery to this community, mm -hmm. the better. And your design has the opportunity to fit it in where it can, but let's look at what that really, 
where we can really take advantage. I mean, I really want us to work on that. I'm really excited about that one in particular. I would, I, the team was telling me just, just today about some of the designs they're working on that, you know, when you have um, the greenery that goes over walls, it's from the top, it hangs down and it's kind of scraggly. Mm -hmm. that it may or may not work. Mm -hmm. They were telling me that they're actually looking at designs that bear, that put it into the wall so that it grows and covers it more completely. So I can't wait for us to come back again later this month and have a conversation about what that looks like. So I think I'm hoping that you'll love it. I yeah. hope. And I would say, I don't want to speak for, for my community, but having a conversation of, okay, well, if we need to take an extra foot to get this greenery. I bet you're going to find some really accommodating uh residents to be honest well, so ha start that conversation if that's an option i i, I want to see what you have for us right, like i said I, I look forward to coming back later this month and having a deeper conversation on that appreciate it thank you mayor council member goldman yes um thank you for attending director tim um i don't have a car i get around with public transit um i took the bus to this meeting tonight uh, and so I really want the project to be successful, but I have concerns. I, I share the concerns of my colleagues. I won't repeat them, but I want to bring up two others. Uh, the first deals with the footprint of the stations. Uh, earlier this week, King County Metro put out their final draft for the Linwood Link connections. They're not going to run any buses along 522 in Lake Forest Park, other than a single bus that's twice an hour during rush hour only. So my question for you would be, why do we still need double length stations? if Sound Transit's the only game in town in terms of buses along the highway. Is that, a, yeah, can we have a win-win there where smaller stations, potentially lower property takings, fewer trees being taken down? Is that something that Sound Transit is considering? Honestly, this is the first that I'm being made aware that there is a reduction in the King County transit through this corridor. So I will have to get back with you on that. I will ask my team for more details that would make a difference in my mind if it truly had no other buses on there that would we it would be a different conversation that was not my understanding I'm, again i'm not here to make promises of what we can or can't do today i'm here to listen and to go back and talk with my team and i thank you for that information yep uh, for the record it's just the 322 bus that's the only end's going to run at ha every half hour so all the other proposals the 372 gets rerouted to shoreline uh, but the other thing i wanted to talk about so i live in the south end of lake forest park near the intersection of 522 and 145th street and what i found out is that the brt project is is going to make multiple bus stops close and by really any objective standard, my neighborhood is going to have worse service once the BRT opens compared to the service we currently have today. And I don't honestly don't know what can be done about it, but I attended every in-person open house pre-pandemic. I've attended all the virtual open houses, and I was blindsided by this. In fact, I didn't get the full details of this until earlier this week, despite apparently the decisions were made two years ago. And so I just want to point out another example of this communications failure that fairly major decisions that impact whole neighborhoods were being made with no public involvement, or at least, you know, no public, you know, you know, not notifying the public. And so just expressing my frustration at the lack of engagement with the public. And I'm optimistic. You know, I, I'll, I take what you say at face value, and I really hope it gets better. But we are at 90% design. So with the 10% we have left, I would really like to see good engagement where we talk about what are some of the concrete changes that can be made. Okay, and I'll say that I, again, appreciate the, the information. I need to go back to my team and my King County Metro partners about what their plans on the corridor uh, for their bus stops and what opportunities there might be to have more conversation around their bus stops. Thank you. Thanks for your time, you have anything? Yep, thanks. And thank you, CEO Tim, for coming right into the lion's den, as it were. And uh, I'm appreciating your answers. I know that you can't commit to a lot of things. You're here to listen. But one thing I'd like to see going forward, just to kind of um, encapsulate my concern, is that all the comments that you've heard so far about the lack of communication between the Sound Transit people and the city and the community. And yes, the uh, pandemic played some role in the lack of communication, but what I'd like to see from Sound Transit, especially from the board, is what's the plan going forward that when this happens the next time, because this is not the end of Sound Transit, of course, how are you going to reach out to the community so there is much more engagement, much more communication back and forth, and more um, abilities to see how one's input is impacting the project? 
I think that's what we all would have liked to see with this project. But if we can't fix this one, maybe the next one is the one we need to fix. Public communication and projects like this has been a passion of mine, that's a lot of peace. Um, for a very long time, I've been working on environmental projects for my entire career, mega projects, small projects, all of them impacting community and traditionally the government. All due respect, I've been part of the government. We don't tend to do a good job communication. It's one of the things that I'm driving to, towards. Next week, there will be an announcement that I'm hiring a new chief communications officer, officer who has international and local experience. And I, my, my goal and one of the metrics for her success is to help us look at new inventive ways to reach out to the community, not to stop, but to keep going and to keep going and to keep going. I understand that the team has done an amazing job. I know it doesn't feel like it. I know it doesn't feel like it. I went back and look at what they've done and the, what they've outreached and what they how far they've gone. I've been to public meetings in other places and in prior projects where you would have a hundred people come out and they say, wow, it's a success. We reached a hundred people in a community of thousands. And I personally feel we can, the industry and government can do better. And that is part of what I want to see Sound Transit also aspire to. We're already doing better communications on social media. We're doing better communications for our passengers. We're doing better communications across the board and we have a long way to go. And I take what you say to heart. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Councilman Castle, one more time. Thank you very much. And, and Director Tim, thank you. So, well, no, Direct Chief Executive Officer Tim, sorry. <laughs> thank you very much for the um, answers you have been able to give us today. We do appreciate that. <clears throat> I, I do want to share with the, the public here too, the fact that I am feeling very hopeful about the future of sound transit. And one of the reasons I'm feeling hopeful is because I've had the opportunity to hear you talk about sound transit a couple of times now. Um, and one of the things that I was most impressed with when you talked to us uh, at the Seashore uh, Transportation Commission was that you take into account the individual experience of the passengers. Um, I'd had the very miserable experience a few times of being on the light rail when all of a sudden the train stops <laughs> and um, you don't know why. And even the driver of the train doesn't know why. Um, and you don't know whether to stay on the train, get off the train, hire a cab, whatever. So I, I do appreciate that you are trying, that you are committed to making improvements for the passenger experience. And I'm also very pleased that you have talked about the fact that the stations need to be functional, that the elevators and escalators need to work and the place needs to be clean and there need to be um, staff there to help people when there are issues. And so I'm hopeful. I see your arrival at Sound Transit as opening a new era for this agency. And so I am really looking forward to what it is you've promised us today. And I um, sort of sit here to say, we will be there with you, and but we will keep pushing because we care about this community. This community has a long history. It didn't get founded as a city until relatively recently, but it's been a community for more than a hundred years. And it's been a community that cared about its environmental, uh, its ecosystem. I, I, I prefer to talk about that it, that way because the environment can mean other things, but, but we have an ecosystem here that we're very proud of. We have wildlife. We have bobcats and deer and eagles and <laughs> otters and all sorts of things. And we want to keep them. And we want Sound Transit to partner with us in caring the way we care about this community. So I look forward to that and we'll see you again. I appreciate <laughs> that. If I can, re if I can take, uh, have a, a little bit of indulgence. I know there's a lot of people that want to talk, but, um, and, and tell you their, their stories as well. I am a transit rider. Uh, I am not a car owner. I was for a while, but I, I came here with a commitment to really use the service and to experience what my riders ride and how they experience it. I ride at midnight, I ride at 6 a.m. in the morning, 5 a.m. in the morning and midday. And it is improving. 
and we have a long way to go. I'm also a biologist by training. I am, and I have a very strong commitment to the environment. It's uh, originally what I wanted to do is I when I grew up, maybe I still will when I grow up. It is very important to me to leave to my child, to leave to future generations. So I share your commitment. I will also say that while I do, am, I, I, I very much hear that the lack of communication has been painful. I, will, I also want to be fair to my staff, that they are passionate, they're committed. They don't do this job because, you know, it's a job. They do it because it's a mission. They love what they do. They have the same values. And yet they're also people. And, um, and they are as committed as I am. I think that the fact that Sound Transit hired me is a reflection of who they are. And I'm allowing them to shine. And we will do better. Thank you. But culture begins at the top. <laughs> and um, that's why I'm hopeful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I'm the mayor. I'm not educated. I don't know how to repair shops, so I talk a little differently. Um, this kind of sucks. To be honest, all these people here were here to yell at you. Yes, sir. Uh, they're not interested in telling me what they think because I've heard it about 20 times now. Especially the gal over here, she's probably got 30 on under her belt telling me. <laughs> so. The problem here is, you know, I'm the mayor. I have supported you all the way. Everybody here gets kind of mad at me because I have supported. I was there on the very first meeting. I was the mayor's meeting. I'm excited about it. I dream about walking down my hill, getting on the bus and getting on the train and going to Hawaii and staying there for a while. And But this is exactly the main problem is we as a city, get, we fight with you. We, we have some really amazing staff that work with you and they know them. We are great people. I've got hours upon hours of my staff have been working with you. We run in the same problem that the people do. The council tonight is a classic example. What they really were here is they want to talk to you and they want Sound Transit to listen to them. May I have it just a moment? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not drive here. I just asked my driver and she's willing to stay. I will stay. Okay, well, there we go. Um, and and, and to, to be fair, she's not my driver. <laughs> that, that's not what I meant. The person who gave me a ride here. <laughs> so this is what I'd like to say. Is, so that's, that's where our money goes. <laughs> that's, that's exactly why I wanted to hear that you would stay and listen to these people because they really want to, they need to get it off their chest. We all know. I've lived here. I actually, it's hard to believe I bought my house 40 years ago. I can see 522. I know. I'm trying to juggle the fact that I know how much my staff is doing and how hard we're trying to get a good project. We actually, like she said, we might know more than you, which is kind of amazing. But um, but I don't have a driver either, so that's kind of cool. But um, so what we'll do, that's I that's just I think the best thing for everybody here is to let you listen to them. And I would love that. Um so we will take a break. If I might, just one thing I do, I, I was serious. I do have staff here and I just want to make sure that they understand that if they choose to come up and speak, they should feel free to do so. That's fine. I understand that too. They, um, you know, and I have, I always have staff here and so well, it works out. So what we'll do, <laughs> we're going to take a little break and then um, we will come back and then we're going to let the We'll get the list out and we'll kind of go with this, but the rules are gonna apply, right, people? That we're gonna stay civil and do a good job of that. And uh, give us about five, 10 minutes and we'll go from there, okay? Thank you. I have to see those Northern lights. Okay, hold on one second. Hey, Chief, bring me the list, please. Okay. Okay, Kathy, it's all yours. People, we're here. We're back in session. Are we ready? Boy, I'm loud. Yeah, well, everybody can't hear. You should use this. <laughs> okay. Cutting down. <laughs> I was a teacher. At home. <laughs> <laughs> Cutting down 384 plus plus trees. How much damage will that really do? 
How much damage will it do to the tree canopy? How about global warming, climate change? We have just been through three of the high, hottest days in record. It's not going to get better. Um, number the next one. I really feel for the people who are being affected by this, the homes. And I think that it would be incredibly important for this body to go and visit them, look at their homes, look at their properties, see what this is going to do to them. Um, I think they need that representation right now. Okay, next time. Third, there is traffic on 522. It sucks. Um, it's, it's really bad. But is a bus or two or 15 going to fix that? Um, I have, I'm almost done too. I have a clip I just received this evening. So it is from the New York Times 2014. And she, I'll read exactly what she says to you, says to me. Here's one specifically gore, geared towards transit. There are three other sources that she has researched for me. You might think that increasing investment in public transit could ease this mess. Many railway and bus projects are sold on this basis with politicians promising that traffic will decrease once ridership grows. But, New York Times is talking here, but the data showed that even in cities, expanded public transit and road congestion stayed exactly the same, New York Times. And a new subway line, some drivers will switch to transit, but new drivers replace them. This is the same effect as adding a new lane to highways Congestion remains constant. I, I, they said it there. Okay. Last but not least, my husband's waiting for me. Um, I have to go see the Northern Lights with him. And he is really tired of me talking about this. He said, just give it up. There's one solution, one solution that'll change everything, change everything. Change the name from Lake Forest Park to Lake Desert Park. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Grace Crowley. Welcome, Grace. Speak. If Sound Transit's plan for Bothellway goes forward, my LFP property will not be taken, I will not be directly impacted by the wall, and my daily commute will not be affected, which is why you should hear what I have to say. We all know the adage, money grows on trees. More importantly, safety grows on trees. The World Health Organization recently reported in 2019 the crashes were the leading cause of death among adolescents and young adults. That's a very scary statistic. A state of Michigan study found that lining roadways with trees reduced speeds by up to eight miles an hour. A study of 10 urban and arterial sites in Texas compared accident records before and after planting trees. Analysis showed 46% reduction in crashes and the trees you know, after they were installed. A 2019 paper featured in the journal Urban Forestry and Urban Greening found that tree cover increases general feelings of safety and simply viewing nature in an urban setting has a calm and restorative effect. These findings also have implications for drivers, in particular for preventing emotionally charged confrontations and road rage. A 2010 study in the same journal also revealed that motorists who view a healthy roadside canopy when driving as opposed to artificially manufactured surroundings, reported feelings of relaxation. These studies show that trees along a road save lives. This matters. 
In addition to making roads safer, trees also increase property values, save energy, reduce mudslides, and make our surroundings more livable. In her book, Green Cities, Good Health, University of Washington professor Kathleen Wolf concludes that the public judges vegetation bordered roads much more positively with ratings of visual quality for an adjoining city or town increasing as the amount of roadside vegetation intensifies. In a related study, drivers indicated they would be willing to travel a greater distance to a shopping area that has natural landscaping and spend up to 9% more for goods there. I came here in the 1980s to start a business that I still run today in Seattle. Not all of us in Lake Forest Park have the benefit of spectacular views. For some who live in apartments and smaller, more modest spaces, traveling along Bothell Way by bus or car during a commute is likely the most scenic and relaxing part of their day. I urge you to consider the preservation of the land and the financial savings that will be gained by abandoning the plan to remove 90,000 tons of soil and up to 500 trees and move to adopt queue jumps, similar to the plan between Shoreline and Lake City Way. This is a forever project for Lake Forest Park. There is a better way. Um, Jeff Snedden. My name's Jeff Snedden. I live here in Lake Forest Park. I'm a co-founder of CORE. We represent the entire city. Uh, not, we're not an HOA. We support S3, we actually do. We don't support the current design because we think the design that works so incredibly well, which I'll explain in a minute, on 145th should be the design that's done here. Um, I look back through dozens and dozens of, of uh, documents on uh, Sound Transit's website. And in March of 2019, there were two des designs considered an eastbound bat lane, the full length. Another one was the one that began at 155th in April 2020. Only designs requiring bat lanes were on the table. And in June of 2020, Sound Transit chose the most expensive of the, th of the three options, the West Shift. No analysis comparing bat lanes to Q bus pass and signalized light alternatives in Lake Forest Park has ever been made. And if I'm wrong, please let me know. Um, you, Sound Transit recently wrote to Sheridan Beach Club that it, uh, that it will save upwards of 20 minutes between Shoreline and Bothell. Well, that's eastbound, um, not westbound. Westbound, um, there's almost no gain made in Lake Forest Park because it's only 40 seconds. Um, so it, it looks to me like Sound Transit is thinking of their $681 million investment in S3, thinking of the ROI based on the bus speed, which is a fine, a fine goal. Um, now, I'm assuming you're familiar with that slide. You showed it today. This is what's really interesting. This is the underlying spreadsheet that uh, has data that creates that slide. Uh, I got this from a public records request, and it's very, very interesting. Um, the data shows during the weekday AM peak times, as I said, it's only a 40 second gain going uh, westbound in the, or eastbound, westbound in the morning. Um, it also shows during the weekday PM peak times going from the Linwood light rail station to Bothell, the bus transit time is 2.3 minutes. You've said that. That's 15% of the total 15 minutes that's on this chart. Um, what's really amazing, though, is it makes you wonder, well, where's the rest of the time saved? And this is really what's fascinating, based on this underlying data. Uh, the, um, there's 20, the 28 blocks from the South Shoreline Station and the intersection of 145th and 30th, coming westbound during peak hours, um, accounts for 62% of the 15.6 minutes saved. That's an ROI. It's also doesn't involve any bus Q pass lanes and it doesn't it doesn't involve I'm sorry, it doesn't involve any uh, dedicated bat lanes. So I'm saying, why is that not the solution that's applied here? According to this data, it's the most successful way to reduce the bus uh, bus time, bus transit times. So in our minds, there is clearly a better way that's never been studied and should be taken seriously if you want to get a good ROI on your invest on our taxpayers investment. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Bud, Lindsay? Right. 
Well, first of all, on behalf of everyone who came to speak, thank you very much for staying. My name is Bud Holmesy. I live in Lake Forest Park. I want to comment on the benefits and the costs of this portion of S3. This project has suffered from two classic problems, time delays and change of scope. The data I quote are with one exception taken from sound transit data. First, the benefits. Bothaway has almost everything it needs except an eastbound bus lane. Sound Transit estimates that adding this lane will save two to three minutes during rush hour, not on weekends, not through most of the day. So from a purely transit point of view, the benefits are these two to three minutes saved. Now the costs. In July 2016, the estimated costs were 481 million. By May 2023, they'd risen to 671 million. One of the reasons for the cost rise was the change in scope. Sound Transit moved the roadway to the west side, the so-called west shift. Um, at the, <clears throat> so at the same time, this added an additional 12.6 million in the projected costs in, in current dollars. Instead of lower cost options has been mentioned, Sound Transit tends to choose the most expensive one. When will this project finish? In June 2019, startup for service was projected to be 2024. By June 2023, it is, and I quote, trending to third quarter 2028. These delays and further delays will almost certainly continue to drive the costs around above $671 million. How much is going to be spent in Lake Forest Park? In 2018, it was projected to be $217 million or 55% of the then total S3 costs. Why 55% for a 1.2 mile stretch? This was due primarily to the very significant property takings and equally significant road work. Applying this 55% factor, the current estimated cost for the Lake Forest Park portion is now $370 million. So I have uh, three questions for you. Thank you for staying. In the face of delays and escalating costs, at what point do the costs exceed the benefits of those two to three minutes on a bus ride during evening rush hour? The current 370 million, 400 million, a half a billion dollars? Number two, what is Sound Transit's fiduciary obligation to the taxpayers? to choose lower cost options and stop the runaway at cost escalation of this project. And number three, why isn't Sound Transit teaching, teaching, treating this stretch of both away as simply a logical continuation of 145th? There is a better way, a simpler way, and a cheaper way to accomplish the goal of improved transit. Thank you. Thank you, bud. Vicki Scurry. Thank you, Mayor, for acknowledging my persistence. I think a year and a half ago, we talked. I did a presentation on walls and greening and landscape and showed you examples of Kenmore and Bothell. And I said something like, if you want to see change, you have to have a vision and you have to be persistent in your vision. And I think I've been demonstrating my persistence and my vision. <laughs> so I want to thank you for acknowledging it. No problem. And tonight, I'm going to talk about noise, because I think that's kind of the elephant in the room, actually. I'm a resident of Lake Forest Park. For 15 years, I lived next to Bothell Way. While Bothell Way has been a noisy road, and I know it because I live there, it has been buffered by over 500 trees and even more shrubs, sited along a variable height earthen bank and rockery along the west side. These landscape features serve to buffer the highway from residents' views and to deflect some of the roadway noise from being bounced back across the highway. I am concerned that the clearing and grubbing and grading up to 16 feet into the hillside will increase both perception of noise levels, the actual noise levels, because the highway will be closer to many homes and it will be no longer screened by foliage. Also, there will be an additional BRT lane increasing traffic volumes and there will be a 4,000 linear foot retaining wall required to support the roadway cut. 
And when I get a little mention about budget here, when I work on engineering teams, the way you cut budget is you cut structure. That wall is a huge structure that is not required. I am concerned because the analysis of noise and vibration technical report that was included in the SEPA was completed before the West shipped. It does not adequately, adequately convey the real noise impacts of the roadway expansion. Also, the collection points in this report appear to be selected to provide decibel readings that does not require sound transit to consider the adverse effects of noise on the Lake Forest Park community. The SEPA should be reopened and the noise study should be redone to provide actual data that is pertinent to this project. Prolonged exposure to noise creates negative health impacts, including irritation and annoyance, sleep disturbances, cardiovascular disease, risk of stroke, diabetes, hypertension, loss of hearing. This road is moving 16 feet closer to people's bedrooms and backyards, into their backyards, and then all of the noise is being reflected back across the street. Sound Transit knowingly chooses to ignore noise and these negative health impacts. Highway noise is caused mostly by tires, rubber meeting the road. And it doesn't matter if you have electric buses because it's not about the electric buses, it's about the tires on the road. Also, it's about the weight. The, basically, the heavier vehicles like buses and trucks and the frequency of vehicles cause or increase noise pollution. Also, the addition of the 4,000 linear foot concrete retaining wall up to 16 feet in height with minimal relief and essentially no landscaping, because I don't consider two cylindrical tubes six inches in diameter placed into a eight inch by 12 inch slot, six inches on, or six feet or 10 feet on center to be an adequate landscape solution to this wall. Um, and it certainly doesn't replace the tree canopy. So essentially no, no additional landscape will reflect the increased volumes of roadway noise, both across the highway and up the previously landscape bank. Noise pollution caused by FT3 will detrimentally affect both present and future generations. Sound Transit must open, reopen the SEPA and redo the noise and the vibration technical report. Sound Transit needs to address noise mitigation. There is a better way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just as a favor, try to keep it close to the three minutes. I appreciate that. Um, a lot of people signed up. So John Drew. John Drew from 41st. And first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, there are a lot of people here today. Uh, they were outside and so forth, but there were many, many more people that couldn't make it. How do I know? They actually wrote to me because I'm the one who did the mailing. And there were, I can't tell you how many people were so sorry and wanted us to represent their feelings about this project. They had to go to the swim meet or there were a variety of reasons. So anyway, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge that. Secondly, I wanted to really thank our council. I mean, I, I'm not gonna talk about the things I was gonna talk about because you've already brought those things up. And I, I can tell you from my perspective, you folks have been listening to us and it's very clear that you're representing our interests. And we, I thank you very much for that deeply. So first of all, I wanted to say that I'm actually a, a, a descendant of Seattle uh, original pioneers. Uh, so I'm a real native Seattleite. I've been in Lake Forest Park for some time. And the, the notion of this West ship, which of course many of us didn't know about at the time, that the idea that a handful of full property acquisitions was somehow uh, a worse proposition than taking partial properties for dozens and dozens and making the roadway really close to them. This is something that resonates with me personally because when I was a kid, uh, they built I-5 right in front of my house on Capitol Hill. And uh, they took out all, all these kids that I played with, you know, their houses were gone. Well, they moved on to nice places elsewhere. And they were the lucky ones <laughs> uh, because our neighbors and us had to suffer for that freeway right next to us. Now there's a sound wall and so forth, but that was a long time ago. But just to, just to give some personal basis for this notion that if you're affected by a partial acquisition, it might not be a better thing than a full acquisition. So another thing that I wanted to say is the idea that the SEPA reports were all great. 
from my perspective, the only one that was great was the aesthetic and visual report, which had adverse findings for Lake Forest Park. Didn't have them for Kenmore, didn't have them for Bothell or Shoreline, just for Lake Forest Park. Acknowledge that things were going to look worse uh, in, in our, uh, our city. So, and also Santa Transit has never acknowledged that traffic congestion will be reduced with this project. It's not. Uh, but the thing is traffic will be altered because the two-way left turn lane is going to be eliminated. And that means that more traffic will try to turn on 165th, go through the neighborhoods, in some cases go through uh, in areas where there aren't sidewalks, where children will be affected by the safety of drivers that are frustrated trying to get around. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Don Feeney. Don Feeney, Lake Forest Park. Sound transit expansion of Highway 522 in Bothell mainly goes through its business core center. This expansion had very little impact on its residential areas. Sound Transit's expansion of Highway 522 in Kenmore mainly goes through its center core. The expansion had very little impact on its residents. Sound Transit expansion of Highway 522 in the city of Seattle on 145th mainly goes through and bifurcates a residential core. Sound Transit expansions of Highway 522 in Lake Forest Park mainly goes through and bifurcates its residential core. The proposed expansion will have severe impact on LFP's residence areas in the city as a whole. The proposed expansion will be at a dollar cost that far exceeds the assumed benefits gained in faster bus throughput on this short 1.2 mile segment. Why is Sound Transit's expansion in the city of Seattle by using Q jump lanes and signal priority on 145th, which is less impactful to its residents and to its community and less costly being denied for Lake Forest Park, which will be the most heavily impacted residential city in this corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jan Nimbles. Nimbles? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I missed Paula, didn't I? Yes. Oh, well, go ahead. She'll come up next. You go ahead. You know, go ahead. You're already up there. <laughs> hey, sorry. He's afraid of me. I know. <laughs> no, I'm Paula Good. I own the Sheridan Market, and it looks like you might have gone by there today to see what we have there. Uh, I'm impacted either way. I mean, it looks like I, whether they shifted to the west or the east, I'm impacted. They're going to take my parking lot. I'm not going to be able to operate as a community space anymore, but I'm still here to talk about property. So I'm concerned about my property because I'm at the top of the stream bed. And I have had to spend a lot of money on mitigation of steep slope sliding already in just in the last few years. So right now I got a call earlier this week from one of your representatives that said, oh, it's gonna be another six to eight weeks before we figure out how we're going to transverse the creek bed. And I said, well, I thought that was unusual because aren't 90% plans already out there? And she goes, oh, no, no, they're not. They're not out there. And I said, okay, well, please check on that so you can know what you're telling me. So that's a concern of mine because they don't have a plan on how they're going to cross my the stream bed. And I'm at the top and I have to worry about all the neighbors down the down the waterway. That is a salmon stream. There's a lot of trees there. Uh, there's artifacts there. I have an Indian artifact, a rock that I found. So there's some archaeological stuff that's going on there as well. Uh, I also wanted to bring up the division of the roadway. 
that I hear a lot about working with the beach club, beach club, beach club, beach club, but there is nobody talking about the people on the other side of the roadway. So the other side of the roadway is also important. They're the ones that are getting all of their property taken. The people that are on the east side, they're the, by virtue of the project, they're getting a sidewalk, they're gonna get lighting, maybe, hopefully, sidewalk lighting. But the people on the west, they're gonna have their backyards taken, it's going to reduce their property values, and nobody is speaking for them because everybody is concerned about the Sheridan Beach sign. Well, let's worry about the Sheridan Beach properties on the other side. So I'm here to speak about them and that they're important too. And uh, if we lose our, I mean, right now, if you go from the Sheridan market and you go all the way down to 165th, that's the only way I can turn around to go back to Seattle. That's the only way that I'm going to get a safety vehicle, either to me or down my street. So there's a safety concern there too, because that's a long way. That's a long way for a safety you know, for police to come, emergency vehicle. I mean, it's kind of not well considered, but I appreciate you being here. And thank you guys, you rocked it. Oh, it's not your turn now. No. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Curveball there. Okay. Um, my name is Jan Nimlas. I'm a Lake Forest Park resident for 44 years. And I really want to thank Julie Tim for being here. It's the first time I feel like anybody has really tried to listen to us. Really, it's reflected in what the council has said. And I'm I'm so grateful to the council for for articulating much of that. I have to say that um, I have voted for every state, county, and city thing that was supposed to improve our lives and other people's lives in the whole 44 years I've been here. And this is the first time I have to say that I wished I hadn't voted for something. If I had known the kind of destruction that it was gonna wreak on my neighbors. Um, my objections to, the objections that we are articulating are, one, the loss of tree canopy along the route is irreplaceable and very harmful to human health. It changes the character of the entryway to our city profoundly from a sheltering green passageway to a concrete noise reflecting wall. Two, the project severely impacts 110 homes along this route, taking a large share of owners back or front yards, opening opportunities for trespass and crime at these homes. A sensitive landslide zone at Bichettel Creek had a landslide near the proposed project, but this zone has not been studied. The SEPA Appendix B needs to be reopened. Three, this plan is a noise disaster, especially for homes in Sheridan Beach with a huge increase in reflected noise from this wall. Current studies show very negative health effects from constant noise, most of this noise created by rubber meeting the road. The SEPA for noise was deeply flawed. Data was collected before the West Shift plan. SEPA Appendix E needs to be reopened. Four, Sound Transit chose the most expensive plan. It will probably get more expensive with time delays in planning and execution. Five, the plan creates permanent devastating impacts to people living close to 522, cutting off access to 38th and 39th avenues, which I talked to people way back at one of these meetings and they just looked at me like, oh, they're there, you don't know what you're doing. Um, would, uh, would make it from problems coming from the south makes 165th the highway for hundreds living in Sheridan Heights and out up above there, as well as a highway on 37th Avenue. This traffic is dangerous to our children and difficult for locals to navigate. A greatly expanded bus stop at 165th does not fit with the neighborhood that has had only 5% boardings compared to LFP center boardings. After Sound Transit dropped the 300 stall parking garage at the center is the plan to make the streets of Sheridan Heights the de facto parking lot for ST3. Reopen Appendix H, transportation. In short, we are concerned about the permanent devastation of our trees and environment, our health and our safety that this plan proposes. There is a better way. 
please reopen your planning to consider what is being done on 145th, the Q jump bypass lanes and signalized lights, a plan that was never considered for LFP. Thank you. Thank you. Julie Eternal. Hi, Julie. Hello. My name is Julie Turnell and I live in Lake Forest Park up on 39th Avenue Northeast. My husband and I have lived in Lake Forest Park for 40 years. For 30 of those years, I worked at Boeing Commercial Headquarters at Long Acres Park in Tukwila. My work to come, sorry, my work to home commute in the evening grew more onerous each year when it reached sometimes 80 minutes to enter my driveway. I won't mince words, the drive was grueling. However, when I would exit I-5 onto 145th to make my way home after turning northbound on Botha Way, what greeted me as I drove down to 165th was, and still is, a beautiful, verdant palette of trees, shrubbery, and greenery on both sides of the street and as far as the eye can see. During those last minutes of driving, I could literally feel myself going into total relaxation and serenity as I soaked in the beauty and felt the pride of where I live. The calming effect that it had on me certainly made it worth that long daily commute. I have spoken to many of my neighbors and friends here in Lake Forest Park who have shared this exact emotion as they enter and exit our very special community. So many of us share deep concerns about the negative impact that the current ST plan will have on our community and will prevail for generations to come. And we are more than concerned about the environmental and emotional impact that we will endure from becoming another environmental casualty for the loss of our trees and wildlife along our beautiful gateway corridor. It will affect thousands of people, as well as our beloved Lake Forest Park Town Center and certainly the many small business merchants. So I have an impassioned plea for the people at Sound Transit. Please, please put more thought and have more compassion and appreciation for our concerns regarding the negative impact that the current project will have on our community. Please reconsider the plan. We completely support making improvements of mass transit. Mass transit. However, as my colleagues have just demonstrated, there is definitely a better way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mary Kay Snedden. Mary Kay. Okay, um, don't see her. How about Dick Harris? <coughs> my name is Dick Harris. Uh, my wife, Vicki, and I have lived here for 43 years. Uh, we live on Botha Way. Uh, we even went to a lot of trouble of uh, actually three of our neighbors of erecting concrete fence to shield us from noise. We're on the, we are one of the fortunate on the east side. Um, so <laughs> my my big deal, and you got, I wasn't going to speak <laughs> because you guys covered it. I mean, you all my issues, you did it. Oh man, I've died and gone to heaven here, you know. <laughs> wow, this is heaven. But, <laughs> but mistakenly, you you decided to stay, so I had to speak. <laughs> uh, I and that's kind of silly, but I I spoke at some sound transit board meetings, and uh, I, I think I could see the whites of their eyes as their eyes roll in the back of their head because they've got a lot of big business to do there. And here I'm talking about the fact that we have no street lighting, never have had, and apparently we never will. But we we raised a family here and uh, we moved here for the school districts and what have you initially and bought a business in Lake City. Um, so we have grandkids now by those children and it appears that our grandkids may actually be able to walk on a sidewalk in front of our house and have lighting in the evening in the dark hours of the winter and what have you. Um, to me, that's a big deal. And uh, so, at the, but I got to say at those San Francisco board meetings, I just, uh, there was one guy that was doing a Nazi uh, Hitler deal and what have you. I don't know if you were there. 
I thought, oh God, you know, you're not going to listen to me. We're all a bunch of idiots, you know. <laughs> anyway, and other things too that particular time. But um, so my big deal, I got to say it is lighting of some sort for that avenue and for the sidewalk specifically. Graffiti, the big walls, graffiti, crime that will come with a little bit of graffiti. And I've sent recently some graffiti here. People don't know it's here, but it is. And it's just a matter of time. There's more density, more stuff comes from our south this way and what have you. Uh, it's, it's coming. So we have to be prepared and we have to do things to take care of it in, in advance. So crime, graffiti, and urban decay are my big things and lighting. So anyway, thank you for doing your job. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and for you staying, uh, very admirable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Barb Sharkey. Good evening, Mayor Johnson, council members, and Ms. Tim. Thank you so much for being here tonight and for staying. That really means a lot. It does. My name is Barbara Sharkey. I will be quick. I wanted to share with Ms. Tim some history. Early on in all this, when Sound Transit was planning to take property on Bothell's east side, such that homeowners there were in danger of stepping out their front doors and having their toes run over by a fast, frequent, and reliable bus, the neighbors joined together and made buttons to wear to the future meetings. The button said every foot counts. If I made new buttons at this point, they would say every tree matters, every foot counts, and every foot costs money, a whole lot of money. Why not consider the design approach of the Q bypasses and priority signaling that is being planned for 145th instead of an entire bus lane? <laughs> Why not have a smaller bus stop at 165th? Why not save money, trees, and time? Why not have a win-win? It has been beyond me since day one in 2017, how in this era of environmental protections, Bothell was ever going to be widened at the ravine, that narrow section with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife dedicated fish stream beneath it. It was beyond believability that a report estimated only a one decibel difference in sound measurements with a wider road, more buses, and the huge retaining wall bouncing sound every which way. It was mind blowing that no one at Sound Transit thought the removal of nearly 500 mature trees and more shrubs wouldn't be a pretty big problem in a city named Lake Forest Park, where removing even a single tree in your own backyard is taken very seriously. <laughs> Around 1994, former Mayor Roger Lotion held up a satellite image and pointed to a green area and said something like, it makes me so proud you can see us from space. Paul Cornish, the previous project director, took one of our Every Foot Matters buttons and said he put it in his office to remind him every day of the citizens living along Bothell Way. Ms. Tim, I'd like to give you my button. Every tree counts, every foot matters, and every foot costs a lot. Please take a fresh look at the plans that have been made and improve them to be protective of the environment and citizen health in Lake Forest Park and responsible with sound transit and the taxpayers' money. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Okay, a button. Wow. Okay. Um, let's see. Dan, Danny Shadle. Danny, I don't see Danny. How about Anna Alberti? Okay. Anna. Uh, Bob Gray. Harriet Gray. Bob's in here and she's not. I'm, I'm sure that's okay. Uh, Wayne Werner. I might be in the green room. That would be my office. <laughs> <laughs> um, Albert Liras. There we go. Welcome, Albert. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm Albert Lerhus, and I've lived in Lake Forest Park for 45 years. Um, I think I'm speaking on behalf of the people living here for the next 45 years. Many move haven't moved in yet at all. Um, but all, everything they said, I'm with it. Uh, and the reason I'm with it is I haven't found anybody who's in favor of ST3's plans for Bothell Way in the community. No one is in favor of it. Um, I really appreciate your coming here. <laughs> this, this isn't easy. This is combat pay. Um, I oppose the proposed design for Bothell Way. Uh, ST3 or ST tells us that. Um, 
they want to reduce the amount of time that people are on the bus and the plan will save about two minutes. And again, the question is at what cost? Money, you know the projected cost, the increasing projected cost. And let's be realistic. Um, how often does a sound transit project come in at or under the projected cost? The media reports overages. The media also reports that sound transit is low on funds and revenue projections are just not what they once were. Sound Transit talks about saving two minutes for a ridership that is not there. Average citizens look at the buses these days, I hear this comment over and over and over. They just aren't the people on the buses that there once were. Um, and they're not all coming back. Uh, remote working is a reality. I'll bet you there's a lot of people at Sound Transit that don't come to the office five days a week, but work remotely. They're not on the buses. Um, as a result, it's unlikely that Sound Transit's original projections or even past ridership will be seen again. The environment, we've heard a lot about this, and I'm sure you could say this in your sleep by now. But our city has the word forest in it. Uh, nobody wants a wholesale removal of so many trees that those trees themselves would constitute a forest. The number of trees proposed to be taken exceeds the definition of forest. Uh, Media reports that the canopy of the greater Seattle area is diminishing. Um, trees are important to our environment. Why add to the problem? Now, I'm going to mention two things you might not have heard of before. That's because I'm old, been around. Okay, the construction of the concrete wall on the west side will increase the reflection of noise down to the west into what is Sheridan Beach. Um, there's a lot of traffic noise there now everybody believes it's just going to increase. When government projects increase levels of noise in residential areas, citizens sometimes respond with legal inverse condemnation actions to recover for the reduction of the property value due to the noise. The Port of Seattle experienced this when they opened the second runway at SeaTac. It's been almost 50 years, but uh, citizens sued them because their property was devalued simply by the increase of noise. The citizens not only prevailed, but under the law, the poor had to pay their attorney's fees too. I mean, it's a major expense. I kind of wonder if Sound Transit has calculated that into the cost of this project. Um, public relations. <clears throat> Sound Transit certainly is not improving its public image by basically ignoring us. And that's the way we see it. We've just been ignored. We ask for responses, we get nothing. And then we hear in the news that people who work for Sound Transit say, they're just coming up the last second. They, they had lots of time to talk, but they never talked. I, I can't respond to that. Okay, Sound Transit can change the plan. Here's something you may not remember either. You ever heard of the R.H. Thompson Expressway? Probably not. The R.H. Thompson Expressway was a major freeway project in the city of Seattle. And it was going to eat up part of the Arboretum and then head south and wipe out hundreds, if not thousands, of homes. This project got underway. Ramps were built. Albert, you're going to have to kind of. I will. Okay. Citizens stopped it by a vote. This can stop. This can change. Nothing is so far along that it can't. And my final comment is this, is that this is just a wonderful opportunity for Sound Transit, this situation. Sound Transit pauses, reevaluates, uses the queue jump uh, approach as opposed to what they're talking about now, saves millions and millions of tax dollars, protects and preserves hundreds and hundreds of trees at a time when the canopy is shrinking, and can tell the populace, the media, other governmental entities, we did all this. Look how much money we saved, and we did it by working with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Greg Louie. Okay, Lindsay Pfeiffer. Alexia Bailey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be short then. Hello. Um, so my name is Alexia Bailey. I live at uh, I live on 522 at 155th place. So a couple blocks north of the Sheridan Market on the east side. Um, 
And I lived for 12 years in New York City, so I'm not at all opposed to public transit. I used to take it every day. Um, so I'm on board with sub public transit, but um, want it to be as smart a plan as possible and, and preserve as much as we can of the whole point of living in Lake Forest Park. Um, I happen to have, my apartment happens to be right behind a stand of mature trees, uh, which I love. There's lots of little tiny little birds that live there. The occasional Stellar's Jay comes to visit sometimes a woodpecker. My cat loves it. I love it. It's beautiful to look at. I also love the trees and I care about the trees on the west side across from, I care about all the trees, but uh, it, east side, west side, I care about all the trees. Obviously it's, it's, it's a lot of it is about aesthetics. My apartment feels like a tree house. I love it. That's why I bought it. Um, I also care. It, about the safety. Safety is important. Um, and people have already spoken about that. I forgot to mention how much I appreciate uh, the city council's thoughtful comments and questions. I thought you guys brought up a lot of good points, so I don't have to. So thank you for that. Um, I worry a lot about heat. It's already hot in my apartment. I do get a little bit of relief from the, the tree shade, but the fewer the trees, the more uh, roadways and concrete and asphalt and all that. It contributes to heat islands. It's a big problem. It's only going to get worse. So I worry about that. Safety and noise, everybody's already talked about. I don't want to go deaf. I really don't. Um, and uh, so that's what it means to me personally. Everybody else has talked about everything else. Uh, that's what it means to me. And I, I appreciate um, what sounds like some uh, willingness to look at things and consider the impact and um, uh, definitely work with our great uh, council, um, listen to them. Hopefully everybody can just do, just do right by us. That's all. Thank you. I'm hoping here, Barbara Chan. Ken, okay, uh, Nancy Herzog, thank you. Got this in a of cruise. It's hard to <laughs> Thank you very much. And I really do want to say I appreciate the comments from the city council tonight. And I do appreciate you staying. It's very late. Thank you. So my name is Nancy Herzog. My husband, David, and I live on the east side of Bothell Way at 157th Lane. And our property is directly adjacent to the road, although you can't see our property nor any of the other houses below us from the road as we are purposefully sheltered behind and below a large row of Leyland hedges that lie on our property along 522 Gotha Way. These are decades old and form a continuous green corridor of roughly 80 feet in length and 30 feet high. This is a key part of similar existing sound and privacy barriers that run along the proposed mile of bus lane work. But apart from the impact to us, which are severe, we would like to point out that we still do not know what is planned. We've been talking with people, the assessors have called us. We don't know, they've given us drawings. Um, I can't read these drawings. They're water, they're electric. Our water thing is right up where they're planning to take the trees. So we haven't even talked about how they're gonna cut off water and electricity to and access to our road. So we just haven't had anybody come and explain these plans to us. So when the assessor calls up and we wanna, you know, we don't know what they're talking about. So <laughs> that's confusing. It's just confusing to us. Um, and nobody's been talking about meaningful alternatives from, from their side, from engineering. Instead, every we were at the 30%. They said, no, don't worry, wait till the 66%. No, don't worry. And we've been worried and we've been telling them we want to know. So instead it's always backroom engineering goes on in an impersonal manner. And then they come back and send us drawings, which we don't understand. So we fully support the efforts of the core to reduce the scope of this project, to reevaluate its worth and absolutely reassess the taxpayer's purchase of this very minor change in the transportation concept. 
you know well that the extra lanes, the destruction of properties and the devaluation of properties will buy you less than a minute in the morning and two in the afternoon. And that's hardly even true because we live right there. We hear it every day, we know the traffic. And unless there's a blockage unrelated to everyday events, it's hardly ever a stop. The buzzes with the buses whiz by us all day long. And why do they need an extra lane to do that? Um, but given the intent of sound transit and the core group has mentioned other better plans, we also wonder about using the existing lanes now with the morning and afternoon alternative, much like express lanes, three lanes inbound, two lanes outbound, you know, same thing and switch it around. Surely a modernization of that using existed lanes would be without property acquisition and disturbance. So we wondered, where is the integrated plan that involves the reassessment? Uh, some gentlemen mentioned the needs are less now for commuters. Most, many people are not going to work five days a week. Um, there seems to be a lot of changes since the original plan six years ago began. So we're hoping that there will be other assessments, a more integrated plan that involves an assessment of traffic, aesthetics, and safety. And we ask that you re reconsider your plans and not um, distribute the kind of taxpayer money that's disturbing the peace of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Weisman. Scott? Okay. I think this says T.W. Dahl. Actually, you guys wrote pretty good tonight. I'm pretty happy. With that. <laughs> um, Carrie Hogan. Oh, Hugginson, sorry, I know your name. You're always all your turn, man. <laughs> Welcome, Carrie. Hey. Yeah, so I think several of you know my name and several of the members of Sound Transit know uh, my name and I appreciate all your comments. I really appreciate that you stayed tonight. It's very important to all of us. Uh, I recently uh, wrote a letter, sent it to uh, you, sent it to the Sound Transit Board, the City of Lake Forest Park City Council, and the Governor Jay Inslee. So I've challenged you and the board to travel along 522 in a bus, look out the windows in the 522 uh, going northbound from I-5 through Kenmore, and you'll notice a significant change in your rate when you arrive in uh, Lake Forest Park with the greenery and trees making it eminently clear that the citizens of Lake Forest Park care deeply about our environment. We are trying to do the right thing. We are asking for adjustments to the current 522 plan that are not unreasonable, yet we are not being heard by your organization as no significant adjustments have been made to your plan in all of our comments. I have been involved from the 10% plan, I've gone downtown and spoken to the board about these plans uh, when they were at 30%. It took forever to get the 60% plans, and now all of a sudden there's 90% plans, and there's been really no change to any of the based on any of the comments we have said. It is not our fault as citizens of Sound Transit neglected to communi communicate with our community for almost two years during the pandemic. Not your fault for the pandemic, but not our fault either. And the lack of communication has given us no voice or ability to communicate with you. And now we are starting to finally communicate. We, uh, these plans have not taken uh, made any changes based on what our comments have been. Many people have spoken about queue bus jumps, uh, minimum, minimizing impact to trees, looking at the design of the retaining walls. I think it would be in your best interest to possibly make those changes. Um, you say that you are re-engaging, but when I have written letters, what I hear is we're re-engaging, but the design is now 90% complete. So this is very empty engagement. It, we do not feel listened to in those cases. So I do appreciate that you're here, but I would hope that we would see some adjustments. This most recent letter that went out, I received a communication back from your communication person who basically in the end said, this, this design is 90% completed. The last 10% is just going to be construction. So you're only going to take comments on construction. This does not, does not give us, again, a voice. We've not had a voice for this entire time. 
I want to speak briefly about lighting. I think lighting along that, that area is great. I would hope that you would not do large overhead lighting because that's going to pollute for everyone onto the east side of that corridor. I, I would appreciate knowing that. Um, several of the comments uh, about the queue jumps and uh, some of the traffic. I'll just say that all of the congestion is really coming at 145th. So it backs up from 145th down through Lake Forest Park. If you if you you speed up everything through Lake Forest Park, but you still have a bottleneck at 145th, you haven't solved any of that problem. So I, I really am glad you're here. I am glad you're hearing. I'm glad that you are listening. I'll be really glad when we see some changes. Thank you. Don Coons. Hi, my name is Don Coons, and I've lived in Lake Forest Park for about 20 years. Um, Bothell Way is my backyard, uh, as I live on the west side of Bothell Way, and part of my backyard will be taken by this project. Um, I'm not crazy about the taking of trees and the increase of noise, but I am a supporter of mass transit. I have four children, and they want a direct access to the light rail, which is going to affect their lives. Um, I know we're not an island in Lake Forest Park. And I think we need to work with the cities of Kenmore, Bothell, Shoreline, and Seattle, as well as King County and Sound Transit. I appreciate our city council and especially our mayor, Jeff Johnson, working with the other municipalities in our area and doing a lot of legwork behind the scenes. I also appreciate Julie Tim for being here and uh, hearing our concerns. And I encourage all the parties involved to work for the best plan to give us the best result. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Very much. Okay, uh, Louis Labrador. Welcome, Louis. Thank you. Thank you to the council for letting me speak, and thank you to CEO Tim and CEO Tim's team for being here today. I appreciate your time, your honor, and your openness. I know your people, your people that have kids, and your people that have homes. And as homeowners and community members, we all invest our time, our money and our futures into where we live and we develop a deep sense of pride in our contribution to a shared legacy. I moved here five years ago. My wife and I bought our first home and hopefully only home because it was so stressful and we also love being here. We're also living parallel to 522 on the west side, just like Don Kuntz. We want to make this part of our generational legacy. We want to have kids, we want them to have kids, and we want them to love where they live, just like we do. We fell in love with the look and the feel of the area, which hasn't changed much since the early 1990s when I visited my cousins here. I and my little sister preferred to come here over the zoo, the Woodland Park Zoo, which is one of the coolest places <laughs> in the world. If you haven't been, you should go, because it really is a forest. Just like the zoo, you can see eagles, osprey, crows, owls, starlets, and any number of beautiful songbirds that live in the same trees <clears throat> that you want to destroy. I have <clears throat> some questions that I humbly request answers to. First, just six short questions for CEO Tim and the Sound Transit team. First, if the wall was up, my wife and I would not have bought our home. What impact analysis on the housing values has Sound Transit conducted, and what was the assessment? Second, what are your long-term goals to limit negative impacts to our community, and how are you measuring success against those goals? What budget have you set aside to measure and achieve those goals over time? Third, are you working backwards from a problem, or are you working forwards with a cool solution? For example, is ridership up? How do you know, aside from the mayor, that somebody's actually gonna use your system? You said that you have to make changes to support a high capacity system. That's great, but what is the utilization of that capacity? Fourth, if we take trees down, we personally have to reforest an area one-to-one. -one. 
I love that. I'm constrained by that, and that's okay. Where are you reforesting all the trees that you're going to destroy? How long will it take for them to establish the same <clears throat> height, vigor, as the ones that you're destroying? These are generational contributions to the community. Fifth, where have you delivered a project successfully and, and have actually observed the success that you're claiming you're going to achieve? Six, citizens here, citizens have brought more data and more compelling data to this meeting than the very bright and competent mind trust of Sound Transit who focuses on this every day. How can we trust your design whose impacts can be clearly described with real data? And I know I'm over my time, but my last question is to the council. Thank you for representing us well with passion. I want to address you as neighbors and friends. Are we really okay with this? From your comments, <clears throat> it doesn't sound like you're okay with this, but at the same time, it sounds like this is a foregone conclusion in your minds. Why is that the case? Is there nothing we can do to prevent harm to our community by blocking this project until Sound Transit comes back and commits to a very short list of concessions that we here agree on as community members? I don't want to accept a 90% design that's complete that can't be expressed in real figures and clear logic, especially with material scope change given the West shift. I don't want to accept that this is a foregone conclusion. Based on your comments, you agree with me. Now, I urge you to dig deep, take an unprecedented stand with us. Let us have our actions be part of a legacy that we fought against what was wrong together. Thank you. Right. Um, Yang Ling. <clears throat> Dick Harris again, I'm sorry. They're my neighbors and they asked me to just say one thing. Okay. Um, so Miss Tim, um, admirable that you walked the uh, avenue there and with your people. Uh, what they wanted to express is try it at night sometime. <laughs> you can, if you can imagine, it's like in a third world country and not on the main street in a third world country and several streets over. Anyway, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gerald Faley. I know Maddie Larson is here. You hear me? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I thank all of you for your comments tonight. I felt really encouraged that you were cohesive in your feedback um, this evening. And that means a lot to me to know where your hearts are at, because I know I have wondered a couple of times where you stood on this issue, because uh, it's it's been a very tumultuous, and I don't think that there has been nearly as much information um, out in our community as we've wanted. And thank you for um, being here tonight and listening to this feedback. Um, I admire you for taking so much time at the end of what I know is probably a very long day already. Um, third, I first, I'm not going to repeat all of the really excellent points our council and our community have made to you, but uh, they, they they bear repeating, um, but I'm not going to do that. I just want to say I, I feel <laughs> much more than what I'm going to say tonight, so I want to add something slightly new, um, and I think it's an important context here. Um, I believe our community, because it's small, this is my opinion, often gets marginalized as being a NIMBY community of uh, residents who just love their trees and birds and don't have the greater good of our region in mind. And I wanna disrupt that thinking. I think it's, it's convenient and it's lazy because our community has decades of history of passionate advocates who have taken their role as stewards of this community seriously, protecting the waterways, protecting the green infrastructure we have. And at a time when our state, our region and our city are making climate action plans and working to fight this existential threat <laughs> to our world. We are working with passion and commitment 
to identify, uh, identify ways to reduce the impacts of climate change and to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And everything about this design flies in the face of that work. And I, I don't think that it, it, it has to be part of the conversation. The economic value that that green infrastructure provides to our region, not just our community, but our region, is the thing that we're doing in our region. We can't profoundly affect housing. We can't profoundly add you know, uh, more from a public transit standpoint. We're, we're gonna add, what, two minutes of savings. There's not a lot we can do as a small community, but the thing we are doing really well are being environmental stewards of green infrastructure that's critical in the face of climate change and that environmental impacts of this project will reduce our climate resiliency in our region. Um, with the removal of the infrastructure we have. And I, I'd like to see that be more part of the conversation because it is such an important part of our policy making in our entire state at this time. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Uh, Jill Reimer. Jill, okay. I'm seeing none. Do we have anybody, see if anybody online would like to speak? If you want to address the council, please use the raise hand function. Heidi Shepard. Go go ahead, Heidi, if you can hear us. Can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Oh, now, now you're moving. May I talk about uh, the BSHSL levy, or would you like me to talk about that when the this particular issue is completed? No, this is his incoming. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right, first of all, good evening, Mayor Johnson and council members and uh, staff, as well as everyone from Sound Transit and half of the population of Lake Forest Park. <laughs> the, re the rest of the population is sleeping because they're under 10 years old. Uh, my name is Heidi Shepard. I'm a resident of Shoreline at 145th. So uh, this is all very interesting to me as well. And tonight I'm representing NUSA the North Urban Human Services Alliance. I would like to thank you for your consideration of the renewal of the King County Proposition 1, other, otherwise known as the Veterans Seniors Human Services uh, Levy, which is on the ballot August 1st. I don't know uh, uh, when ballot uh, the pamphlets dropped in Lake Forest Park, but I received mine yesterday. Uh, the five cities, of North King County have made progress in meeting the unmet needs of our residents. The passion that you've demonstrated tonight for the forests and the streams and the fish and the birds extends to the people as well in Lake Forest Park. Uh, and in many cases, actually most cases, this concern also represents a significant budgetary commitment. And the basic needs that we have seen in the past are continuing to grow. All of us are very aware of the budget limitations of all of our North King County cities. This levy is the largest source of financial support for human services throughout King County. And endorsing the levy so that it passes is critical if we are to have the means to meet the basic needs of our communities. The levy renewal will continue to support specific populations like veterans and seniors and will also continue to address housing security, financial stability, and access to nutritious and affordable food. We need the levy to pass to support the healthy communities that we so treasure in North King County. Thank you very, very much for your consideration. Thank you, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Anybody else online? Yes. Yeah, sure. Thought it could be. Um, yeah, let me, there's some, yeah, just come on up. Um, people online, you're gonna have to wait. I miss somebody in real person. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see her. <laughs> Mayor Johnson and council and guests in the audience. I'm Teresa Lacroix, the director of Shoreline Lake Forest Park Senior Activity Center. It is indeed a pleasure to be here tonight. And I am taking a stance on, uh, I have never made a political statement in 45 years of my career. 
in my work, or I have in my personal life, but in, in work, I have left it up to the participants, the clients, the individuals that I serve make their decisions. However, tonight I am speaking out and asking for your support of the Veteran Senior and Human Services Levy. How does this, um, I've sat here listening to all these fabulous comments, the brilliance of your questions and the audience. And there are two things that really stood out. One is this room was filled with a couple people, 50 and over, just a couple. <laughs> And it was amazing to hear how their voices haven't been heard. And there was a history that has passed in 2018 that our voice wasn't heard for the senior population. The other thing is that we have needs. Northwest King County has needs. And we are overlooked many times Thank goodness for council member Rod Dembowski. He has fought endlessly to support us in our communities from youth through older adults. So I'm asking you to endorse it, but I'm asking you to go forward and ask questions, all of you. How have they changed the process of allocating funds in this round? They say it's equal 30% veterans, 30% services, human services, and 30% seniors. Who's on the committee or the decision-making? Is there a representative from Northwest King County who knows us and understands us? That is a critical question. We have been paying taxes. We are gonna pay taxes on this if it goes through. And I pray that it does. It's a fabulous opportunity to help our whole county, but please ask questions, send your support with wisdom. You have shown yourself to be brilliant tonight. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but wow, you get to go back to the office with amazing conversations. And I hope the same continues for us. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Actually, I saved you because I knew Heidi was coming on, so I did that. that <laughs> um, anybody else online? I thought I saw another hand up. Can we stop now? I, we were just called brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, Donnelly. Kevin Donnelly, welcome. Here is Kevin. You there? Hmm. Might be on mute. <clears throat> Kevin, you there? I guess not. Something's going on. Something's wrong with your computer, I think, Kevin. Um, does anybody else online like to speak? Okay, not seeing any, I think we'll close citizens comments at this time. And first off, I'd like to thank our guest for staying. And I'd really <laughs> like to thank her driver for staying. <laughs> and I'd also like to give you guys a hand. Nice job, I appreciate that, good job. I think we'll take a break for a few minutes, let people do what they need to do, council. And after five minutes. Okay. And uh, thanks again. Right. No, and then my my even on camera. There we go. Oh uh, yeah. Get over. Hi, hi everybody. We're back. The the mayor has had to step yeah. out for the evening. Uh, so point. I will be carrying on for us here as chair. Uh and many Many thanks to everybody who came tonight and to our, um, to Julie, Tim, and the staff of uh, Sound Transit. We really appreciate their being here and staying for an extended period of time. Um, after citizen comments, we have consent calendar, the consent calendar. Do I hear a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Mr. Uh, Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, May I ask for a grammatical change? You may. 
Um, this is the minutes from June 22nd, page six, um, ordinance 23-1271 and 23 dash, well, actually it's um, 1271. Um, just that uh, lines 14 and 19 reflect that I recused myself as opposed to absenteeism or abstention, pardon me. Thank you, Council Member Olivo. Um, do the, do the, does the first and seconder accept that as a friendly um, amendment? Yes. yes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent calendar with the amended minutes as recommended by Councilmember Lebo, please say aye. 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 Any nays? It passes unanimously. Thank you, Council. And then we're moving on to uh, Council Committee reports. Uh, well, Council Member reports. Council Committees, we have not, I'm trying to think, making sure, no. Let's move on. Do you want a cancellation? Button? Yes, thank you. Help? Just in case, and for the edification of the public, and if you all didn't see it, I sent out a reminder that we have canceled the budget finance meeting for next week. It was reflected on the calendar, but I didn't know whether everybody had seen it. I want to make sure everybody uh, recognized that. Um, and then we are moving on to council member reports, and it is my fervent hope that we'll be very brief. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I shouldn't have said that apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not been to a lot of meetings. But yeah. I lost her from me. You, you, you have earned the right to take as much time as you like. Thank you Thank so much. You very much. Um, all right. So, solid waste. We'll start with that. Um, so, we did hear a report from Cedar Grove that there's still a large amount of inappropriate items in the compost and yard waste bins. Um, stickers on fruits and vegetables are a particular problem. So just a reminder to anybody who might still be listening out there, always take those stickers off those apples and oranges and everything before you put the peels in, the, um, in your recycle bins. Um, 18 cities have now signed the REPLUS pledge. That was the last thing I heard time I heard. Um, um, don't think you need to hear any of the rest of that. Um, okay, and then uh, we move on to Noosa. Um, so here's when I might uh, personally tell you that I endorse the levy for the veterans, seniors, and human services. It's unfortunate that we as a council are not able to endorse that this evening because there are some um, regulations around that because we did not actually state it on the agenda, nor did we invite pro and con speakers. We might put that on for our next meeting, but our next meeting is just four days before ballots are due. So it's a little late. So I just would urge personally, everybody to give good consideration to this levy. It's tremendously important to our uh, entire county and also to us up here in the Northwest. Council um, member on point, I would still recommend that we go ahead and move forward with notification for the 27th, I believe it is, and move uh, for con add consideration of endorsing the levy uh, for that time. Councilmember Cassover also on point. Um, I I believe that uh, we all, some of us recall that we, the Shore Lake, uh, Shoreline Lake Forest Park Senior Center did not get funding in the first round of the previous levy. And so uh, I heard Council Member Dembowski say that that was going to change. I heard our our senior center director still being concerned about that. So if we could add that consideration um, to our, our uh, proposal, I would appreciate that because that, that was a huge oversight. And I think they did some Band-Aid fixes, but I'm not sure that equity has fully been restored, so. Thank you very much, Council Member Bodie. It's very important that we do um, everything we can to make sure that there's more equity there for our own uh, senior center. And I totally agree with you. Um, 
So one of the other things we did here at the last NUSA meeting was the fact that um, there are a lot of food and lunch programs for children throughout the summer. Um, school districts, libraries, and the Y are all um, participating in that. And um, uh, I just hope the public is aware of that and, and will support it when they can. And then the other thing uh, that we did here is that the new King County Homelessness Authority CEO is going to be meeting with various agencies up here in the north part of the county um, to talk about a severe weather shelter. And um, we might ask our city administrator to give us a bit of a report on the last thing he's heard about the cities uh, also meeting together on that. It's concerning to me that with um, potential heat and smoke uh, being in our future here this summer that we don't yet have a location or staffing model. So um, I'm hoping that maybe something will happen there very quickly. Growth Management Policy Board meeting um, I had earlier this month. Uh, let me see, um, population continues to grow. Uh, even despite everything <laughs> that we've been hearing about how terrible things are here. Um, the Seattle's growing, Mount Lake Terrace apparently is really growing and so is Linwood. Um, and then the uh, comp plans, um, there, is, there are 61 of 86 cities in the region have been contacted by uh, Puget Sound Regional Council regarding uh, preparation for the upcoming comp plans, which have quite a few changes in them. Um, and they have produced a stormwater guidance document for comp plans, and uh, there are equity planning resources available at their website too. So there are a lot of resources there for our um, planning commissioners and our planning department. Um, Middle housing was developed. Um, there are toolkits now uh, that are being created um, by the Department of Commerce for cities so that they can um, meet the new state regulations around middle housing uh, and the new zoning uh, regulations. Let me see, there's a new grant program being developed. Um, and there are some consultants who've helped some cities uh, do an evaluation of where in their city it makes sense for them to really push new zoning uh, to allow more middle housing and where it doesn't. And it was quite an interesting conversation and I participated in that because one of the things that these consultants have found in, some, in a couple of cities that they've already worked with is that when you just look at a map and you see single family housing and you say, okay, yes, let's you know make sure that duplexes and triplexes and uh, ADUs and everything go, can go there, you are not taking into account the actual economic constraints that may exist in some areas, but not others. And one of the things I discussed with the consultants and people agreed and some other cities agreed is that soil conditions can really vary and that really changes the cost particularly of multifamily uh, building and we here in Lake Forest Park are seeing that because despite having um, zoned for multifamily properties along the 522 particularly on the east side developers are not able to actually find ways to economically build there because the soil conditions require so much mitigation for taller buildings. So these consultants are helping cities identify problem areas like that versus areas where the zoning, changing the zoning makes more sense. So uh, it was an interesting conversation and I, I hope that we hear more about it in the future. Um, so there is going to be a statewide grant opportunity for implementing um, uh, House Bill 1110, whether or not we as a city 
would benefit from uh, going for that, I don't know. Um, God, I got a lot of notes here, guys, I'm sorry. Uh, residential infill. I think I'd better share this with the planning department. It's probably not so much here for us. Okay, seashore. Uh, we had a whole presentation from the Washington State Department of Transportation that was really interesting because they are only just now adopting the complete streets philosophy and will not put out their new um, plant, their new guidance document or whatever it's called, um, until this fall. And so they admitted that they are playing catch up and the cities are actually much ahead of them on all of this. And, and it did occur to me that this actually has some impact on what's happening on the 522. No, I, unfortunately, some of the new regulations have a sort of a start date and, and our project is her occurs before that, but one hopes that the sort of philosophy that they are now uh, trying to adopt, you know, might spill over and we would see a more sensitive and um, intelligent design of the 522, which includes slowing down speeds, by the way, that's part of the whole complete street safe system approach. So we'll see what happens with that. And I can certainly give you more information about what we learned um, if you want it. Um, and then we heard from the um, King County Metro and the Seattle Department of Transportation about the improvements they're making or the, the plan, their, their study that they're going to do for State Route 99, Aurora. It's one of the busiest bus lines and roads in King County. It's missing sidewalks in something like 30 blocks. Mm -hmm. um, it has no bike facilities. It doesn't have enough pedestrian crossings. And 17% of all Seattle traffic fatalities occur on State Route 99. Okay. So very um, important and timely study that's taking place, but they fully admitted that no matter what they find in the study, they don't have the funding to do what needs to be done there. So it's going to be many years before we see real improvement there, but um, it is on its way as a design, as a plan and design. Okay, guys, that's it. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Cassover. Uh, Councilmember Goldman. All right. Um, I attended uh, two additional meetings. Uh, the first, uh, Administrator Hill and I attended RACER, the uh, Principals Assembly. Uh, we got a, a, just a briefing from uh, direct, uh, Director Brooke um, about how things are going. They're, I think, roughly halfway or, or a little bit, maybe two thirds of the way through staffing up. They're actively looking for additional. Uh, workers. Um, they We got an email that they got, a, I think, over a million dollar grant from the uh, state association. Sorry, it's late. I, I can't remember names and abbreviations, okay. but the police uh, and sheriff's group. Um, so that's a huge grant, which will help fund additional uh, social workers to go out. So that's good. And most importantly for us, that might have been the inspiration for the uh, charcuterie plate that we, we had at the uh, work session. <laughs> that was a uh, racer. Um, and then I attended the tree board meeting. I shared with them that we had passed the interim ordinance on the uh, tree right of way trees. Uh, they started some informal talks about what they might like to see improve as we go from the interim to the permanent. They will continue to discuss this, though so, um, scheduling might be a bit of a challenge since it's summertime and they're already short staffed. Uh, they only have five members. There's a sixth member who is sort of on hiatus, so they it's hard for them to have a quorum over the summer. But two areas, one, um, when if there's an in lieu of fee, would that in lieu of fee, is it purely for replanting or could it also go for tree maintenance or property acquisition? That was a topic they wanted to discuss. And then the second, there's uh, it says that you have, there's a special list of 30 foot tall street trees is that list, is that just if you're along the street or is it for the entire 500 feet on each side corridor, which would be a couple of blocks away? So if you're two blocks away from a project, should there still be a 30 foot limit on tree height? So those are a couple of things that, that they're going to be looking at. Also, um, they expressed some interest in working with the parks board. Uh, so the tree board has a number of tree walks of Lake Forest Park. 
they are interested in doing something similar for parks, so sort of like a like nature walk of Horizon View Park. So um, talking about trees, other uh, foliage, wildlife, that sort of thing. So um, interested in, in moving that forward. And uh, so that's the uh, tree board. So that's my updates. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Bodhi. Yes, um, the Planning Commission meeting's been postponed um, till the last week in July, but the Parks Board met and they're working on a number of projects. So I'll start with the walking tour <laughs> idea. Uh, they, they have looked at some possible uh, routes that would make sense. In general, they tend to rule out Horizon View because it's a problem with getting parking, sufficient parking there and a lot of neighborhood impact. Um, but there is, uh, there was discussion of, uh, oh, so let me just say yoga in the parks has started. The first session was Saturday, over 50 people attended again. Nice. Um, we've streamlined the, uh, the liability waiver. So people only have to sign it once. They don't have to sign it every single time. So thanks to Corey and I guess Kim for that. <laughs> um, uh, and then the they're looking at a number of activities uh, which they're uh, spending time planning before the lakefront property process starts full force. Uh, and so one is a walk that would perhaps start at town center and weave through a number of um, of the parks and then end up possibly closing Perkins Way uh, for like a few hours on a Sunday, maybe in the fall, um, so that people can walk there because the parks board members mentioned that uh, they think everyone who walks along uh, Perkins is takes, you know, is brave, basically. <laughs> uh, and so, but that that's everyone was very excited about that. M maybe not all the way up, but for some distance. So it could be kind of a, a community walk, uh, like yoga in the parks. But it, so it wouldn't be, you know, something that would occur every weekend, but it would be a one time special event. And then last but not least, one of our new Parks Board members has had experience getting uh, borrowing our stage and uh, for a multicultural event at Meridian Park and has uh, connections to these multicultural grants that the city could get. So Corey's working with her and it's possible that we would have uh, in the spring, uh, maybe four weekends in a row, a different multicultural event in a different location. Like, so maybe one could be at a Horizon View Park, uh, but she's got a, a list of performers and stuff and and you know her her she has a grand vision where food trucks would come to and so forth but anyway uh they're very it's a very good active group looking at ways to get more people into the parks um doing fun things so uh i'm looking forward to their input on the lakefront property with the good good ideas they have for our existing parks Thank That's it for me. Thank you, Councilmember Voting. Sounds great. Uh, I guess Councilmember Riddle, please. Um, so briefly, we had the North King County Coalition on Homelessness meeting today, and uh, we had a presentation by Alexis from um, the Regional Homelessness Authority. And so they started getting some early numbers um, as they've been collecting. As folks uh, go for services, they go they they put their data into the HMIS. And one of the data pieces that they track is last uh, city of residence or what they consider their last city um, of residence. And so they've been collecting that for the North End cities. And they're uh, so far, they've got over 500, I think it was somewhere like 545 uh, folks who have considered one of the five cities um, in the North End as their city. And they, there are some that have actually uh, listed Lake Forest Park as their city. So every city has representation of uh, folks that they've been serving. So just wanted to kind of lift that up that we are doing the right thing. That there are folks here that need the help and, and um, I'm glad that we're part of the solution. Um, Healthier Here, uh, they canceled this month's meeting that I was invited to join the executive committee. So um, I've accepted that position. So now I'm going to be uh, assisting, continuing on a volunteer basis to help them on the executive committee. Um, and uh, to, in order to do that, I did step down from the Joint Recommendation Committee. Um, so right now, uh, Sound Cities is, is uh, looking to uh, infill that position uh, or that 
uh, an alternate to, this is my alternate to cover. Um, and lastly, I just want to lift up that um, next Tuesday, July 18th, is the uh, Go Electric event at uh, Third Place Commons. So uh, for those that are interested in what it would take to go electric for uh, cooking and so forth, uh, there's a great opportunity there to, to get some information. So that's what I've got. Thank you, Councilman. Councilmember Furtani, excuse me. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. And uh, um, actually, uh, Councilmember Riddle took a little bit of my thunder, but uh, yes, in <laughs> fact, the, uh, uh, under the leadership of Sarah Phillips, the Climate Action Committee is sponsoring that Go Electric thing. I call it the Tri-Cities Wizarding Tournament, but it's not really that. It's a collaboration between Shoreline, Kenmore, and us uh, to offer three uh, talks throughout the summer. Uh, the first being, of course, the one on July 18th, yes, at the uh, third place commons at seven o'clock. I'll be emceeing. We have Dr. Mark Bossler coming in talking about the advantages of induction cooking, and we have a chef coming in to show us how to do some induction cooking. And then the other talks are going to be solar power at the hangar in Kenmore on uh, August 17th. And then finally, there's going to be a talk about, uh, let's see, um, uh, heat pumps at, uh, let's see, Shoreline City Hall on September 19th. So um, they're, they're all at seven o'clock, they're all free. So I really encourage people to come to those. And then uh, finally, um, we come meet the Climate Action Committee. Uh, we'll be having a table at the farmer's market on July 23rd. So come by on a Sunday and we'll be there from 10 to two. Thank you, council member. Anyone else? And I can do my quick spiel here. Uh, SEA pick was last night. Uh, council member Bodie and I attended that. Um, Rather than go too deeply into it, I will send out the agenda. You can see the, the materials, which I think are quite interesting on a couple of topics. Um, salary setting process for cities, various different ways, either commission or uh, through the, old, the older antiquated way. Um, there is a, There was a discussion about affordable housing committee charter review, which is still really pending. There's a lot to be done there. Um, regional emergency management coordination. One of the takeaways like that from that just quickly is there is really a big push for trying to ensure that electeds have additional training for coordination of emergency management. We're very fortunate to be part of DEMCO, of course, and, and that whole uh, organization, but the, um, they're trying to encourage the region to find better ways to get electeds up to speed on how to coordinate uh, emergency responses in various situations. There was actually a couple of anecdotes that were talked about relative to um, experiences that counts or policymakers had had. Um, so I'll send that out to you. There was also uh, a um, summer events discussion, which I always enjoy every year. I can't believe I've been doing it. I think this is like the 10th year with for me with PIC, either as an alternate or the primary person. But the summer events around the region are pretty cool. There's a lot of really neat stuff that's going on. Um, and so many of the cities now are really ramping up in a big way because of the pandemic. They Everybody was sort of you know, shut down, of course. And and so they're going all out on some of these events and, and various things from salmon bakes to art shows to car shows. To, I mean, it is just the whole uh, gamut, particularly um, the latter part of July, which is really interesting. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, and I just give a shout out to the chief and his team. I know that they have, we had a presentation on non-lethal um, uh, weaponry, if you, if you will, if that's the right way. And I just received a package of biodegradable kinetic rounds for my non-lethal uh, 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 air pistol. So I thought it was kind of interesting now that the industry and non-lethal things are starting to move in the direction of getting things that are biodegradable and uh, good for the environment. So <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> and they're green. If they can have seeds in them. This I, could, this could I wouldn't recommend you eat them, but you know, um, you know, anyway, so. If there's nothing else for the good of the order, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, we have a hand in the Oh, corner. I'm sorry, Phil, I apologize. City Minister's report, I keep doing that. It's because I can't see behind the screen here. I, I know you want to get out of here, but um, Council Member Castover did bring up an item uh, for me to address is severe weather shelter. Um, we're meeting again next week. That committee is meeting quite often. Um, Shoreline and Kenmore cities have identified some possible locations for severe shelter. Um, there will be a funding ask at some time to the city council, 10,000-ish um, range or somewhere in there. So keep that in mind as we get moving forward. 
There is money at the Regional Homeless Authority. They have about $250,000 to stand up severe shelters, but that's not just for us. That's across the entire county. And so that's going to have to be spread out. And then they have about $225,000, if I remember right, to staff, help staff those. But there's going to be a gap. And so we're trying to identify what those costs look like and what that gap is and how cities can step up and help. And so that would obviously through our budgeting process, become one of our community partner type of things. Um, I think one thing that um, Council Member Riddle and I heard today is, you know, faith-based communities are shrinking, things are getting pulled back, they're losing their ability to support this, which is where everybody has leaned in the past. Um, and then they lean on cities. Um, there was um, one of the pastors men mentioned, or maybe it wasn't the pastor, anyway, somebody mentioned the fact that you know, there was the opportunity to reach out to a um, a builder developer that's holding a, a perfect piece of property with a building that would work and they're not interested in playing at all. So um, there's a lot to work out. Anyway, stay tuned. I'll keep you up to date on how those those talks go. Um, Principals Assembly attended with Councilmember Goldman. Uh, just a reminder, Councilmember Goldman needs an alternate for that. So if one of you would like to be his alternate, you don't have to come to those meetings at, at the start three times a year in the future. That may come down a little bit, but um, we could use an alternate there. Um, then quickly to the comp plan. Uh, Steve and I are meeting with the consultants tomorrow to initially talk about where, they're, where they are in the process of their scope and budget. Um, and part of the reason that the planning commission meeting was kicked out until July is... Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. So we have time to meet with um, the planning commission um, with them as well. We won't have a um, contract in place for the total dollar amount, but we will have um, them there to start listening, start engaging with the planning commission. We, I had also asked them during the interview process if out of the goodness of their heart, they would give us some little like flyers or postcards that we could take to national night out because I don't want to miss that opportunity to get the word out of, Hey, you know, save, save this place in your, in your schedules. Um, and the last thing I sent you an email out today, we're ready to go on the Octavia Butler street dedication. Um, press releases go out tomorrow and we'll, we'll stay on top of that. And the agenda is set. We have our speakers. So that's all I have. Unless you have questions. Any questions, council? I actually, I, I do have a question. So when we um, when we signed the ILA with the Homelessness Authority, we actually specified in there, if I remember correctly, that our our share of the funding that we were providing to the Homelessness Authority would be for severe weather, weather shelter. Can is that do do we have um, a way to monitor that to make sure that uh, that that they uphold that part of our agreement. Yeah, I'll check into that. I had forgotten that detail. That's a good, great question. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Hill? I want to take two seconds. Chair's privilege. Um, colleagues, I have to say I was very incredibly proud of this community and this this policymaking body. I, I I can't tell you there there in in my tw nearly 12 years of policy making and having attended council meetings in other communities and seeing big groups this is one of the largest groups we've ever had here probably the largest and um everyone on this dais was incredibly respectful thoughtful on point as well as the community was incredibly restrained and thoughtful and respectful and and it it uh, my hats off to all of you and to the community because that really isn't the case around uh, in other places and it really speaks volumes about all your leadership staff's leadership as well as the culture that we have um, really enjoyed as Lake Forest Park units so uh, I'll leave it there yes. with that we're adjourned and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's only been five hours.